family. This is a personal study. I uh, ran across this primate title again and just want to put it on the record for those who don't know, um, as I didn't and also forgot. Uh, so let's get started. Peace, 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 family. This is a um, personal study. I got to talking to a friend yesterday, and I was like, you know, primate is a bishop. <laughs> it, it is the clergy member. I, I said for clergy member. And so we got to looking this thing up, and um, I got to thinking about it uh, afterwards. Um, if you guys look in the description, if and my question is this. If primate to date is an honorific title for a bishop, Metropolitan, uh, exarch, or any of this stuff, then why is there a scholarly discussion between the secular world and the religious world about whether or not we evolved from monkeys or primates or any of that stuff? Wouldn't that be a whole freaking fallacy that they've been playing on us with mind games? language uh spell casting if you would and and you know you guys know i've been raised in the church and i'm not the perfect person in the church so don't get it twisted if y'all listen to a couple of my last posts you understand i ain't never been perfect but i i just thought this was really um interesting because it's like uh i feel like it was all fabricated you know and and mind you, this is not to attack anyone, but I have other questions as well, because um, I guess I would need to know what is that exclusionary part of being called a primate or a monkey in other religions, and, and namely one cult, if I would, would be something like you know, the Hebrew Israelites, for example, okay? Um, if, if, if these religions, the three major Abrahamic religions, and of course, their subsidiaries in Christianity, uh, Hebrew Israelites, and the like, um, if we hold on to these things as how we were raised or what we believe or even tenets from it, then how do we look at this thing about being called a primate? I mean, it's almost like it's undercover, for example, because when I was looking at this, 
you know, it comes down that, you know, it gives some specific examples of um, what this title is and how it comes from the Catholic uh, Church, if you would. I think the Anglican as well. Um, but those of us who adhere to it or have adhered to it, uh, how how do we look at this thing? You know, how do we look at this? Because, you know, people want to say it's, you know, creationism. And, you know, there's been debates about creationism and evolution. And um, is that just busy work that people have been doing over the centuries? Uh, not to get down to the real history, because, you know, I have to put in a few questions on my little Microsoft pilot. And, and one of them was, when did they start calling, you know, bishops using that word primate for religious leaders? And ironically, it shows up in the 1200s, um, also shows up in the Latin. So, you know, I got to look at some other things kind of funny when people say, we spoke Latin. Anyway, um, but um, it shows up in the 12th, in the 12th century. I think it was the 12th century. And so I'm looking at how, you know, that secret treaty of Verona comes out in 1213, you know, the early 1200s, um, early 13th century. And I'm wondering, is this all related? Because, you know, we're looking again at the isms, schisms, and divisions, and people, you know, a squatulating, well, I hate to use that word because it's just fun to use, but, um, you know, people doing things, you know, talking about we was all in the ship, we was a barrel of monkeys. At this particular point, we were a barrel of monkeys, okay? Um, you know, so I'm just looking at this like, wow, this is, this is, this is really interesting uh, that many of us don't know that, you know, they call us monkeys um but i want to jump down this rabbit hole for a minute okay i want to jump down this rabbit hole for a minute oh hmm. prime primat instead of primate let's go look at this oh the name was given by carl linnaeus because he thought this was the highest order of animals hmm I think we got to reject everything, Carl Linnaeus, uh, you know. Anyway, let, let's go look. Let's go jump around a little bit. Let me bring some things in. This is not going to be a long study. I just want to get this on the record. Uh, come on in here, Navi. Thank you. Okay. Not even going to deal with that. Looks like the computer's acting a fool. Uh, welcome to the room. Welcome to the study. Let's Let's go look at something. Okay. Now, we know that a monkey is supposedly a primate, right? Uh, who do we want to take first? Hmm. Let, let's go here first. Let's keep it basic first. I know somebody is saying, no, you're, you're, a monkey is not a chimpanzee. Shut up. <laughs> I'm sorry, my man. Let's bring some shit in. Shit, let's go to that good old favorite Wikipedia first. Start out real easy. Hopefully this won't take too long. All right. So we should be looking at this monkey, right? This this. Wikipedia idea of a monkey, I, I think it's disrespectful to actually be calling human beings primates and looking for monkey bones and shit. Because, uh, well, anyway, I'll leave that alone. Um, because, you know, I see some monkeys doing some stuff. <laughs> In a couple of videos that I saw, you know, monkeys doing some stuff. Uh, I'll use the kitty word for it, hunching on each other and stuff, you know. But I know they got a social structure. I, I give you that part, right? But um, let's read a little bit, okay? And it looks like we're going to go right into the 1800s. 
Okay, so what we got, monkey is a common name that may refer to most mammals in an infraorder semiforms, okay, also known as simians, is, ooh, damn. Okay, what's this? Order, uh, intraorder. Uh, order is the highest of the eight major hierarchical, hierarchical taxonomic ranks in Linnaean taxonomy. Is classified between family and class. In the biological classification, the order is a taxonomic uh, rank used in the classification of organisms and recognized by the nomenclature codes. Yeah, whatever, Mr. Linnaeus. Okay. Semiforms. Simians, simians, simians. I don't see no human beings, but yeah, they got a lot of stuff in there. Simians, anthropods, and higher primates are an intra order or infra order of primates containing all animals tradi traditionally called monkeys and apes. Most precisely, they consist of the parvorders, platyrrhini, and catarrhini. Uh, the latter of which consists of the family of that long ass foot stupid word right there. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, that long ass word. Um, old world monkeys in the stricter sense. And the superhuman or super family, homeodea apes, including humans. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's take a peek here. What is this? Uh, New World Monkeys. Mm. Okay, New World Monkeys. I ain't, I'm not going to that shit. Back into the class and order. Old World Monkeys. Okay. Mm, baboons and red colobus and macaws. All right. All right. Yeah, let's get out of there, okay? I, I, like I said, this is just the easiest part, but they call them simians. Simians and has something to do with Mr. Carl Linnaeus. Yeah, we can reject him, can't we? Mm -hmm. I, I really, I can say that there is no missing link uh, between the two. It's a matter of what you call a thing, and it's spell casting at its finest. If you guys remember, uh, the word thing is an assembly, which is an assembly of men making decisions, if you would, from way back in the day, uh, similar to what we call um, Congress or the House of Representatives today. Senate and the like. And then, like, we were looking up the last one. We looked up just war theory. And I have made mention about how they'll use very basic terms to uh, keep you from finding a thing. But when I ran across this primate again, this, this connection with religion and primate, I just found it really interesting of all the discussions that I've heard um, in my lifetime, not social media, just social media, but in my lifetime about this creation versus evolution and, you know, the school we came from monkeys and yeah, 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 that part. Um, and, and it's all been a whole waste of time. Okay. Because like I said, I looked on the, on the pilot, let me see if I can pull that up. Because, you know, this AI does help us a little bit. Let me see if we can pull this into the stream. Let me see if I open it up first. Maybe I can pull it into the stream. Might be able to. But when we look at the, if I can't pull it in, I'll just. Um, no, no, extra camera. That's not what I want. Um. Like I said, it mentioned the 1200s. Let me see. Would that be another window? Yeah, here. Okay. So I used the AI and asked a few questions. Okay. This last question right here. Um, when was primate first used as a religious title? 
It says the term primate has a fascinating history in the context of religious idols. Let's delve into its origins. Around the 12th century, the word primate emerged as an ecclesi uh, ecle ecclesiastical title. Here's how it came about. Let's find out. Etymology, the term primate. And I have the etymology pulled up as well, but um, like I said, this won't be a long stream at all. Okay. Um, the term primate traces its roots to medieval Latin. It was derived from the late Latin adjective primus, which means of the first rank chief or principal. Um, thing that's standing out to me right now, as far as that's concerned, is if you guys remember when we were talking about Oxford and Cambridge, uh, that split that happened in there, and when we were talking about Onesimus and Cotton Mathers, um, the inoculations, if you would, from Onesimus, and how there was a relationship with the naming of that person who was supposedly here in America with the scripture, uh, of the same name that talks about Onesimus, that it, when, when the scripture said something to the fact that uh, one brother wanted to make sure, the, the writer wanted to make sure that you accepted this other one as a dear brother, that my speculation was this is, was about um, them going to a school not a religious organization or something that can't be found and that, in my opinion, it can be um, recognized uh, at least in the schools of theology um, for something like Oxford and Cambridge and something like that, even though it may go back further. Um, the other thing that is supportive of this is the fact that like with um, St. Areptilus, you know, he was pictured, and we got to get back to him, okay, because he had a nice afro and everything. But um, St. Ereptilus, who may be St. Andrew or St. Francis or something to that point, um, hijacked by St. Paul possibly, but um, that uh, Ereptilus from way back in the day, uh, the person they, they called the first bishop in the medieval times, if you would, he was surrounded by snakes in his stand, on the stained glass depiction. He was surrounded by snakes, spiders, and turtles. And um, it's just not willy-nilly. If I was 5, 7, 10, 13 years old, some shit like that, you know, I might think that it's just, you know, randomly put there that these animals are around him or something like that but what i'm finding and what other people already know and this is for the people who don't know um that these bishops were scientists they weren't just religious people okay so in some aspect to have a discussion over the recent decades because i've only been here several decades if you would uh, to have these discussions, this creationism versus um, evolution seems to be the still the religious faction trying to overcome the secular faction, which the secular faction was dealing with science as opposed to uh, idol worship, if you would. Okay, and so it's my speculation that those first bishops were scientists and not just mere religious leaders, even though they may have been a religious about what they did, which means you just do something over and 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 over again. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so schools, schools, education, academia, this type of stuff, right? So um, they say here on the pilot that is derived from the Latin, late Latin objective primus, which means of the first rank chief or principal, okay? The object, the objective itself is based on the Latin word primus, P-R-I-M-U-S, meaning first, okay? How come they don't call Adam primus? I'm just saying, you know, 
call him Adam, but they don't call him Primus, right? More than likely, it would be Primus if they were talking correctly. Okay, not anthropomorphizing uh, ideologies, if you would. But anyway, let's continue. Uh, meaning and usage. Initially, a primate referred to a high bishop an eminent ecclesiastical official who held certain jurisdictional authority over other bishops within a specific prov uh, province. Um, I'm remembering here about how, um, you know, <laughs> Paul was supposedly the bishop over, uh, he was an apostle, which is supposed to be, some say it's a, a, uh, an apostle ranks higher than a bishop and some people say that an apostle is a bishop. Some people say that apostles start churches, um, overseas churches, which makes him a bishop and an apostle, one and the same. So Paul himself would have been a primate. Okay, let's continue. This authority often included acting as the vicar of the pope. Now, this is interesting and overseeing other bishops in their region. Because, you know, the Pope said he was vicar of Christ, and now you're saying that, um, that primates, primus, primus, if you would, the first ones um, represent, or, or should I say, um, act on the behalf of the Pope which again goes back to the secret treaty of Verona, ameliorating their own interests. Let's continue. Now y'all see that okay? I guess so. All right. Um, primates were designed as chief bishops with rights of superintendence over an entire district or area. Hmm. Monkey see, monkey do. All right. Uh, let's go a little bit further. Privileges and precedents. Historically, primates of specific sees were granted various privileges. It says the right to call and preside at national syn uh, synagogues. Uh, so it ain't a church, it's a synagogue. Yeah, well, who knew? Uh, jurisdiction to hear appeals from metropolitan tribunals. Mm -hmm. Aren't we always talking about having tribunals or something to that point, getting back to our old? Yeah, never mind. Um, the honor of crowning the sovereign of a nation. Oh, shoot. Is this part of the problem? Hmm? That we can't crown nobody because Jack fell down and broke his crown? I'm just saying. Okay, anyway. Y'all know I'm talking shit, right? Okay, anyway. Uh, presiding over an investment or an installation of bishops in their own sees, okay? Um, these privileges vary across different regions and historical contexts. In the Catholic Church, <coughs> excuse me, in the Catholic Church, in the Latin Church, a primate is typically an archbishop. So you got bishops and archbishops, and it doesn't necessarily mean they're in the same freaking order. But anyway, uh, Okay, anyway, um, or rarely, rarely a suffra suffragan or exempt bishop of a specific provincial see, provincial see. Looks like we're going to be asking a question on that one. Hold on a second. Because um, that looks like that's going to be a question. Let's find out what a provincial see is. Let's see if we can pull this other one up real quick. Provincial. She'll see. Did I spell that right? It looked like I did. Where'd you go? Y'all still here? Yeah, y'all still here. Um, did I spell that right? Oh, no, I didn't. Okay, so let's go back over here. Uh, put that A in there. Oh, you just going to do all kinds of stuff, huh? A-T-I-L-C. Takes you right back to primate. Primal C Church. 
um, takes you back to Bishop, takes you to, okay, Mother Church. A provincial see is a mother church, which more than likely is going to be Church of England, as we're looking at this again. Uh, the first see or provincial see of a regional or national church is sometimes referred to as the mother church of that nation. For example, the local church of Armagh, like Armazag or Amazad, but A-R-M-A-G-H, is the primal see of Ireland because it was first established, it was the first established local church in that country. Similarly, let, let's go into this. Let's go into this. What is a provincial C? Let's uh, see if we can switch y'all over for a second. Let's see if we can switch y'all over for a second. Uh, okay, let's stop sharing the window and let's share the screen. Provincial C. All right. So provincial C is the mother church. Okay. Or a mother church. Mother church or matris is a term depicting the Christian church as the mother in her functions of nourishing and protecting the believer. It may also refer to the primary church of a Christian denomination or arch diocese, i.e. the cathedral church. Um, for a particular individual, one's mother church is the church in which one received the sacrament of baptism. The term has uh, specific meanings within different Christian traditions. Catholics refer to the Catholic church as H Holy Mother Church. Okay. There it is, provincial local ch uh, churches. The first C or provincial C of a regional or national church is sometimes referred to as the mother church of a nation. For example, the local church of Armagh uh, is the primary, uh, primary C of Ireland because it was the first established local church in that country. Similarly, Rome is the provincial C of Italy and Baltimore and Baltimore of the United States and so on. Mm, so... Baltimore is a subsidiary of Rome. Nice to know that. The first local church in all the Christ, uh, of Christianity is that of Jerusalem. The site of the Passion of the Christ and Pentecost make it the mother church of all Christianity. Okay, okay, okay. Let's back on up and come on out of that. Plantation churches. Plantation churches? Hold on. Plantation churches. What do y'all call that? Hmm. Cathedral, holy name, cathedral in Chicago falls under this category. Okay. Cathedria. Um, churches of the Latin World Federation and Anglican Communion, while other Protestant denominations tend to refrain from using the title in this manner, uh, as in Mother Church. Okay. Anyway, where's this plantation church? Another t uh, form of the phrase is mainly used in Protestant churches. A mother church is one from which other daughter churches were planted nearby. Okay, so there are a lot of different mother churches, a lot of different primential churches. Let's go back to our article. <sighs> Let me come back through. Hopefully the study won't take long. I appreciate you guys from being here. Oh, somebody said something in the chat. What's going on over there? Hey, Alexis, how you doing? Peace to you. Just a little quick study here real quick. Just, you know. Trying to get all my I's dotted and my T's crossed uh, of understanding so that I can avoid certain hijacks. Uh, window. Let's go back to window and let's bring back in the co-pilot and finish reading that. All right. So there's the co-pilot. Okay. Let's bring this so I can see. All right. So the um, co-pilot, Microsoft co-pilot says also... 
um, the primate holds precedence over the bishopric of one or more ecclesiastical provinces within a particular historical, political, or cultural area. While the office is now purely honorific, the Archbishop of S X Tirgon or Grand in Hungary remains an exception retaining uh, certain powers. Legacy. Where the title of primate exists, it is often vested. No, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, where the title of primate exists, it is often vested in one of the oldest archdioceses in a country. Hey, DJ. Uh, these archdioceses were often based in cities that were uh, um, significant when the country was first Christianized. Okay, okay. Even if they are no longer the present capital. Mm. Okay, so the churches were the capitals. Okay. Um, so the term primate has a rich history, blending authority and honor, and continues to invoke curiosity in the realm of religious titles. Yes, it does. Uh, let's jump back up to my first question on Microsoft. Um, if you guys also notice in the description, you will also see that I have added the title of the music uh, that I used on my last post because, yeah, you, uh, YouTube gave me a copyright uh, notification. And I'm like, for what? I didn't use anybody's video. The only thing I did use was that song Rebound. So I said, well, maybe it's because I forgot to put the... Um, the link down there because I, I paid for that to be put up here. So I don't know why they're trying to give me little copyright strikes because it didn't come from the place where they say you can't use music on YouTube. So YouTube, stop it. Okay. All right. So um, let's read a little bit of this and it's probably going to go right over it again. Yeah, it's going to go over it again. So again, it comes from the word premise. It means first. Uh, ecclesiastical title bestowed upon a bishop who holds a position of honor and bishops were over cities, okay? Townships, bureaus, boroughs, and all that shit. The significance of this title varies depending on the tradition. All right, I'm skimming because I don't want to reread what we've already read. Um, down here in the one, two, three, four, fifth bubble, under Catholic Church, it says, for instance, the primate of Poland does not have jurisdictional authority over other Polish bishops, but enjoys honorary precedence among them during liturgical ceremonies. See, see, some people are trying to do this right here. I think it's funny, okay, that folks do certain things. Yes, I uh, see you, DJ. And certain people do certain things, and because people are not aware of what those things are, it goes under the radar. But at this particular point, when y'all start talking about monkey bones uh, in recent history and in the future, understand that some people are going to know that y'all talking about religious bishops and stuff, no matter how you discuss it. Okay, because Carl Linnaeus ain't a fucking source and it should never be tied with religion. And it has been because some folks are very religious, holding on to the tenets of religion while saying that they're not religious, <laughs> that they're scholarly. Yet that part. Mm -hmm. Prima Donna Adonis. OK, OK, help me out now. Help me out, because there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that never got decoded when I was in them halls or should I say them buildings or whatever. Um, OK, what else do we have? Uh, other church, oh, wait, wait, Anglican, Anglicanism. Within the Anglican communion, the primate holds the highest ranking position among bishops in the church. The Anglican primate serves as a spiritual leader and often refers or represents the church on national and international level. <laughs> Fashionistas, yeah, that's right. Uh, other churches. In various other Christian traditions, the term primate may be used differently. Yeah, like 
evolution. Uh, but it generally uh, signifies a bishop with special recognition or ceremonial status. I wonder how many titles does that really include? Mm -hmm. uh, I see you, DJ. You know that W-E-A-R that you're putting up there and equating it to war? Well, you know why that would make sense if the two words were synonymous? It would make sense if the E and the A are connected like they used to be. Yeah, we got some some spell casters amongst us. Okay, like one brother says, the culture's in the language. Hey, Juice, I'm just trying to do a little quick study on this word primate, the monkey trick. Okay. A diphthong. Okay, okay. I think I heard you say that word before. Somebody did. So the last uh, sentence here says, so when you encounter a bishop referred to as a primate, remember that they're not just any ordinary bishop. They're the first among equals. Ooh, nasty. Nasty, nasty, nasty. Uh, let me see. Okay, we didn't read this middle section, the second question, why was the primate of Hungary an exception? And this was that word grand or is his name in here? Yeah, his name is in here in part number two, Peter Erdo. Erdo, Erdo, yeah, whatever. Okay, let's go. The title primate is generally a honorific bestowed, a generally an honorific bestowed upon bishops in older Catholic countries. However, there's an interesting exception the Archbishop of Etzterdegum, or Gran, in Hungary. Here's why, historical roots. The Archdiocese of Instagram, almost sounds like Instagram, but Instagram <laughs> has a rich history dating back centuries. In the 14th century, the Apostolic See granted a privilege to the primate of Hungary. The Apostolic See, mm-hmm. Okay, this privilege allowed the primate to make decisions on liturgical matters within the territory of all of Hungary and all uh, and over all Hungarians. Uh, still sounds like a little bit of that hundred to me. Okay, you know, for the good conduct and people judging folks in an open air venue. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know how they used to tell us that six letters removed. Okay. Um, what's that other thing they, they was, uh, shoot, hold on, let me think what I was thinking about. Uh, territory of all hungry. Damn, I forgot. I can't remember it now. I got to stop looking at you, DJ. You have me all over the place. Okay. And, and it's not your fault. It's just me. Okay. But, um. Damn, I forgot what I was going to say. Let's continue. Anyway, it's gone. Uh, this unique privilege has never been abrogated and remains in effect. Liturgical matters, liturgical matters. Special privileges. Okay, some people, I think some people are trying to get them special privileges. They might just call them chiefs now. Okay, but anyway, let's go. Same same thing, different dollar, different language, cultures in the language. Uh, Cardinal Peter Urdu, okay, this is why Hungary, uh, what, doesn't use that title, is an exception. The current Archbishop of Estragon, Budapest, Cardinal Peter Urdu, holds the title of Primate of Hungary, okay? Uh, he's over all of the Hungarians, like the Pope said, he was over all souls. There's my point. Uh, my point was that at one point I heard that there was no separation from the soul and the spirit. But, of course, it looks like it falls right in line with the um, isms, schisms, and divisions, if you would, that these two things are now separated. And we can have major discussions about what a soul is, what a spirit is, what spiritual is, what soulful is, yada, yada, okay? Um, when at one point they were not separated, they were one and the same, same way that um, church and religion are still connected, even though we have the illusion 
that they are separated and the same way that religion and politics are the same things, even though they look like they were separated, but they are not. Just want y'all to know because you can't put you, you can't get up from where you didn't fall down. This is where you fell down. Okay. In 2021, a fake statement at, at, attributed to Cardinal, Cardinal Erdo circulated on social media. It claimed that he opposed Pope Francis' restriction on the traditional Latin mass. However, the arch, um, and then the next bullet point, y'all can look that up if y'all want to, that fake statement, because uh, it's probably not the only fake statement that went out here. <laughs> A-E-I-O-U. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. I can't play that song either because, you know, anyway, it will leave that alone. Um, however, the Archdiocese of Buda Budapest clarified that his statement was entirely false. Cardinal Urdu had not issued any such statement. Uh oh. Uh oh. Y'all wait until we get to the word. Pro uh, Hey, Amerigal, wait until we get to the word propaganda. Um, this is one of the reasons I hope it comes up again. But the term propaganda, and I think it's the one that's in uh, Britannica. <laughs> propaganda, propaganda is not a secular term. <laughs> I'm just I'm just helping. Uh, you know, one day I'm going to pull out this SAT book and see if I can pass this bitch. But anyway, propaganda is not what we thought propaganda is, just like Primate is not what we thought it was. But anyway, let's continue. Despite the fake message, the unique privilege granted to the primate of Hungary remains a fascinating historical anomaly. All right. So while most primate, uh, primates hold an honorary position, Cardinal Erdo's role as a primate of Hungary carries a distinct historical significance that sets it apart from other primate titles. Why? Because he was just under the Hungarians? Okay. All right. So let's bring y'all back around. Let's stop sharing that. And let me see. Let's go. Um, I'm saving one for last. So let's hit these other ones that I want to grab. We're at 42 minutes right now. This is not going to be a long stream, hopefully. Uh, did we do Simeon? I want to do primate. Let me see. Okay, yeah, we did Simeon. We kind of briefly looked at Wikipedia. All right, let's bring this one in. This will be... <laughs> okay, first of all, let's go to Wikipedia. I'm going to show you all something real quick. Let me show you something. All right. So, for primate. On Wikipedia, they give us this order of mammals divided into whatever that word is right there. You recognize all the different animals, this, that, and the other, the animal kingdom. Primates have large brains. You know, that, that kind of goes against when they start discussing cranial sizes in, uh, what is this, archaeology and stuff? When they, uh, you know, um, when they start to discussing who has a big brain and who has a small brain and all this other stuff when when you slide over here that you know a human is supposed to be in the primate family if you would that primates have big brains but why do you make the distinction secular world and religious folks why do you make the distinction when you start talking about human beings whose brains are larger i'm pretty sure the monkeys and the chimpanzees and the lemurs and all of them ain't having that damn discussion anyway okay but you call them the smartest ones i'm just saying okay um relative to body size compared to other mammals as well as an increased reliance on visual acuity uh at the expense of the sense of smell which is a dominant sensory system in most mammals these features are more developed in monkeys and apes and noticeably less so in lorises and lemurs most primates also have opposable thumbs. So primates, including gorillas, humans, baboons, are pri uh, primarily terrestrial rather than arboreal, but all species have adapted for climbing trees. I ain't climbed a tree in a long ass time. Okay. Uh, arboreal. Okay. Gotcha. 
Our real locomotion techniques used leaping from tree to tree. I ain't done that for uh, yeah. Uh, mm, never mind. Let's get off of that. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, they stuck some humans down there. All right. Uh, primates are among the are among the most social of animals, forming pairs or family groups. Uh, unimale harems and multi male, multi female groups. Non human primates have at least four types of social systems, many defined by the amount of movement by ad uh, adolescent females between groups. Uh, primates have slower rates of development than un other similarly sized mammals, reach maturity later, and have longer lifespans. Primates are also are the most intelligent animals, and non human primates are recorded to use tools. They may communicate using facial and hand gestures, smells, and vocalization. Let's get the hell out of here. Okay, wait, they showed, they rammed all of us into that. So I'm just gonna say this, I, I, I'll say this just for the sake of helping a few people. If people gonna say that we primates and they're the most intelligent and they're not gonna reveal that a primate is actually a bishop, if you would, <laughs> an honorific title if you would then I say flip the shit on them okay flip it in this aspect they call you a monkey tell them you're a bishop and start ruling over things rather than discussing it under their spell cast of language okay oh a union of two vowels pronounced as one single syllable uh, late 15th century diphthog or diphthog uh, from Latin, late Latin diphthongus. Thank you very much, DJ. Appreciate you. I bet that word is not in this SAT book. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'm just saying, flip it on them. When you start hearing them talking about, you know, we monkeys and we primates, no, tell them you're a bishop. You're the bishop of your own soul since they want to play the game and been playing the game because most of us didn't know that primate was a religious title from way back okay so what's this one say down here uh zoonotic diseases uh close interactions between humans and non-human primates really <laughs> can create opportunities mm, never mind i i'm not even going in there okay to hell with that shit all right Let's move around. Let's move around. I want to take you all over here because here's another another little fun fact still from Wikipedia and still under the term primate. Mm hmm. Oh, OK. I just guess it just backdoored me into the same thing. Hold on a second. Where is that term at? All right. This is what I need to find. I need to find the word French. On this page, let's find French. I don't want to edit nothing. I just want to find the word French. Are you guys with me or did I forget to bring you over? Oh, no, y'all coming over. There it is right there. Etymology. Let's look at the French because we've seen the Latin and the Roman and the Anglican and the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Thank you, DJ. Etymology. The English name primates is derived from Old French or French Primat, P R I M A T, from a noun use of Latin, P R I M A T, from primus, which we read earlier, prime or first rank. Now, <laughs> we was first, right? Right? We were first, right? Uh huh. On the whole planet, what, what are we arguing about? Because it looks like we've been the bishop from the very beginning, the first from the very beginning. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So the last is the, it, so the first is the last to know what it was in the beginning because we choose not to go. Yeah, yeah never mind. Anyway, let's let's look a little bit more. Uh, the name was given by Carl. There go that. See, see this this is the person that called y'all primates. Okay, and y'all following him. And no, you shouldn't be following him because he wasn't qualified to. To name things like Adam when Adam should have just been Optimus Prime. <laughs> just saying, damn Decepticons. 
Okay. Anyway, let me stop. Okay. Um. Hmm. Okay. Let me let me read a little bit more. Okay. Stop playing around. So the name was given by Carl Linnaeus because he thought this the highest order of animals. The relations among the different groups of primates were not clearly understood until rel relatively recently. So the commonly used terms are somewhat confused. Yes, they are. For example, ape has been used either as an alternative for monkey or for any tailless, relatively human-like primate. Oh, so this is why we got gorilla primps. Uh, gorilla. Uh, my. Lamore, stop, DJ. They're going to get mad at you. You can't expose that much truth. <laughs> Lamore. Oh, shit. Y'all see that little dark spot on the screen down there? I just tried to remove it off my computer and realized it was, see it moving up the screen at the bottom. I thought that was a bug or some ashes. But um, anyway, it's a dermatera, okay? Y'all remember in school, they give us all these damn terms. We didn't remember all that shit. That's a bird. That's a dog. That's a cat. That, yeah, we just kept it very basic, okay? Uh, but let's read a little bit more. My bad. I'm over here talking shit. So um, Sir, Sir Wilfred Le Gros Clark, Le Gros Clark was one of the primatologists who developed the idea of trends in Primate, primate evolution and the methodology of arranging the living members of an order into an ascending series leading to humans. Mm. So th this, this kind of falls along those lines of a dog don't call itself a dog, a bird don't call itself a bird either. Uh-huh. Man be doing some shit. All right, let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. Commonly used names for groups of primates such as prosimians, monkeys, lesser apes, great apes reflect this mythology. Methodology, my, my evolutionary history of primates. Several of these groups are paraphyletic, or rather the, they do not include all the descendants of a common ancestor, and we're sitting up here talking, we got people running around here talking about we got common ancestors, and y'all ain't even looking at where this shit coming from, Carl Linnaeus and Sir William Le Gross Clark. And not from archaeology, but from primatology. Primatology. Devane, son of, okay, I got you. A borrowing from Semitic has been proposed, Devane finds it conceivable okay what did you say up here let's see you're gonna make me i don't even know if i'm gonna be able to say this one here operary 1650 from latin operarium bee house beehive noun use of neuter of appararius of bees from apis bee a mystery word unrelated to any similar word in other Indo-European languages, at Prairie. Mm. Uh, well, DJ, in light of this one right here that you put up there, I have to work, ask you, is that kind of like the other word that they use, P-R-I-O-R-I, -I, uh, in the religious narrative, just changing the vowels, is that also a beehive too? In the church. Mm-hmm. Yes, Juice. This is what parents be saying, okay? But it ain't just the parents. It's the scholars and the religious, lo uh, you know, they, they be over there debating about all kinds of stuff, you know, scholars and things. And, and... Okay, DJ. Okay. Partis sequenter vitrum. You are what your mother is. Latin law. Uh, status. I don't know how you say that word shall follow the mother. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I just found out I'm a bishop. Okay, anyway, I'm just playing. All right, so y'all see a little bit of that, um, this French, how French and Latin uh, are associated here in the etymology. Is that what we're looking at? Yeah, right here in the etymology. And then we have another name, Sir Wilfred uh, LaGrosse Clark. I got a picture of him. Let's see what he looked like. 
Nope. But look at him. He was a British autonomous surgeon, uh, primatologist, and paleoanthropologist. Uh, today, best remembered for his contribution to the study of human evolution. Mm-hmm. He was Dr. Lee's professor of anatomy at the University of Oxford. Didn't I tell you they came out of Oxford and they were scientists? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But folks still talking about worshiping Jeeves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Would you say your initials are mass? I know. Shit, my name, I told you my name relates to truth, okay? Anyway, all right. Uh, let's, let's, let's move around a little bit so I can get to this one on Britannica. Okay, so we got Latin and French running around here. I don't think we're going to get anything different. Some say it's a monkey. Some say it's a religious leader. Some say it's religious leaders acting as monkeys. Mhm. Oh Lord. They didn't took they didn't took the monkey primate thing all the way back to the 251 million to 65.5 million years ago in the Mesozo- uh, Mesozoic era. And yeah, y'all should stop that. Y'all shouldn't even have these damn discussions anymore. Now that you understand that primate has been mixed and mingled through language to make you talk about monkeys and chimps and gorillas and lemurs and all that shit as opposed to the order that you fell from. <laughs> and he's still coming soon. I know, okay? Man, my grand my grandchildren are going to be grandparents by the time, and they're going to still be waiting for them, okay? Anyway, you can't get up from where you didn't fall from. All right, so let's go into Britannica. I just thought this was really interesting when I look was looking at it. Uh, this Tracy had a good old time. Like, what? You're kidding? Yeah, yeah, they've been playing with you. They've been playing with you. So to reestablish your orders. Now, see, some folks would get mad because if I really got honest about it and told you, you know, the people that have been hijacking your shit is the Prince Hall Masons and them fuckers right there. That's why I got so upset when homeboy called me Easter star knowing good and damn well I'm not. Um, but see, some people would get upset at me if I say, hey, look at this over here. Look at the history. Look what they did. You know, Mason, Moors and Masonry and all that other shit. Look what they did. Okay. And then understand how you fell. If they destroyed your building, they destroyed your buildings. Okay, uh, they say convert or die. Okay, because you know <laughs> you had to have something. They needed somebody to build in bricks. I, I was che- I was teasing with Tracy the other day about this, and I said, um, "Yeah." And and these folks out here talking about we 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 built all this stuff and we had Kent castles and all this stuff, right? I said, just because you built it, don't mean you was the one in it you could have just been the servant of under it building it and and in light of that damn they made you work twice as hard because they didn't give you no damn straw mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. would you say they were the ones that helped colonize us yes they look like us so they infiltrated yes juice exactly exactly okay Exactly. I know y'all think I'm chain smoking. No, I got air going on and my cigarette keep going out. All right, let's bring in this one um, from Botanica. <laughs> you fuckers. Okay. So this is Britannica talking about primate. And this is the one we started with, but I just wanted to bring some other things in so that we would understand. Because you see, it's got some highlighted words. We're going to check that out. Because I think this is the one where propaganda pops in. Okay, wait, wait, DJ. I, I saw Carthagena. Mm. I had a friend, his last name was Carthagena from uh, Florida. Uh, car, 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 ask. Christ, crust, anoint, anointed one, dark, swarthy, Stuart, Stuart. Stuart. Okay, I don't know if you meant Stuart on that. Yeah, you know, that was crazy, DJ, to go in there and look at that story about Pygmalion and Dido and find out that that was a whole hijack. But just to see that little one little part in there going back to the religious versus the um, 
academic and the folklore versus the science, if you would, just to see that in that story, Pygmalion and Dido and all the theatrics that went on, there was this one little window that talked about the Dido theory or the Dido effect, meaning it was mathematical, is a mathematical formula. But if we don't know that, we stick to the illusion. Like I said many months ago, sometime last year, when I ran across the story, I don't know if I can accept what it's saying there, okay? And from all the hijack that's going on, uh, it's, a, it's a grain of truth in there. You know, like I was telling um, Fontrese, uh, since they wanted to use folklore, mythology, and all of that, I said, well, I said, it's a grain of truth in it. I don't believe it as a whole story. I think it's something that they made up because as they showed, Anias and Dido lived in different time frames, so they couldn't have been together as some people have reported in their theatrics and writings and this, that, and the other. I said, but since they want to use folklore and mythology and all of that, I said, what was the gift that the princess had in the princess and the pea? Okay. And, um, you know, she didn't know whether to say it or not, but it comes down to she couldn't sleep. The princess was the one that could lay down, according to that mythology, that folklore, um, the princess was the one that recognized there was a, something under her pillow. <laughs> it's like a little tooth fairy. Okay. And so it's a little grain of truth in there. And I've always been trying to pull out a little grain of truth. I'm not saying I'm a princess, but I wasn't saying I was a bishop either. <laughs> but apparently we are. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, let me, let me stop. Let me stop talking shit. Okay. The rod of nod. Uh, yeah, we got to look at that. Is that Caduceus? Um, Caduceus? Is that ca the Caduceus? Um, the snake that eats his own tail? Hijacked by Nimrod. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that part too. King's titles. Carl, Carlos, Charles. And yeah, Carl. Yeah, I did see that the other day. All right, let's get back to this. Okay, my bad. Let me start reading the chat. Primate in Christianity and it, <laughs> all three Abrahamic religions, just because they said Christianity, you Hebrew is like, y'all don't get away with it. Okay, you don't get away with it. Okay, but anyway, um, even to talk, touch on that, uh, one of these lives I got to go back and look at because one of the studies, I don't even know if I did this one on live. But going back into that 10, 11, 1200 period, somewhere in there, um, dealing with like the ethel red and the Canut and all of that, there was a division where some of them ended up, I think, going over to Byzantium. I think that's where they went. Um, and I, 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 I'm pretty sure that might be where we find this. Uh, people coming out thinking that they're Hebrew Israelites or something to that effect, but I'm not sure. We'll, I have to check that out later. But anyway, let's read. Uh, my, my apologies. Primate in Christianity, an ecclesiastical title for a bishop in some churches who has precedence over another uh, number of other bishops. In the early church, it was several. It was one of several titles, including. Check this out. Who knew that the word metropolitan was a title and not just a city, okay? Exarch and Patriarch. Mm. Let's look at Matri Metropolitan. Let's see if we can pull it up. Metropolitan is the ecclesiastical title. Ooh-wee. Ooh-wee. Metropolitan in the Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Anglican Church the head of an ecclesiastical province. Originally, a metropolitan was a what? A bishop of the Christian church who resided in the chief city or metropolis. Does Superman know that? I don't. Anyway, let me shut up. Um, of a <laughs> civil providence of the Roman Empire. 
and for ecclesiastical purposes, administered a territorial area coextensive with the civil providence, mm, coextensive with a civil providence. Church and state ain't separated. And, and it's probably separated because of the ism, schism, and, and division that was going on. A metropolitan primate. Mm hmm. Okay. Uh, the first known use of the title in church consular documents was the Council of Nicaea. <sighs> did y'all know that? Did, did y'all know that the Council of Nicaea has something to do with a metropolitan? We knew it had to do with bishops, but they didn't tell us about a metropolitan. And if it was a metropolitan, what what, what territories were they residing over? Mm -hmm. That word. Okay. Anyway which definitely established a metropolitan in the organization of the church. Damn. So it wasn't even supposed to come outside the church. Oops. The following general pattern of civil government. Let's see. I'm pretty sure it's going to say something here. The following general pattern of civil government. The expanding church created ecclesiastical provinces, each headed by a metropolitan. You see how they put that word down in lowercase like it is in a title? Y'all check that out? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you won't see it. Just like just war theory, just like the word king or thing being an assembly. Okay. Um, who was assisted? <laughs> see, see, look at this. The expanding church created ecclesiastical provinces, each headed by a metropolitan who was assisted by his suffragan bishops, each of whom headed a diocese, uh, a diocese within the province. You know, see how they put metropolitan up here and then they don't really tell you over again that that was a title, that that was actually a man, if you would a being, a person, okay? They make you think it's a collective. It's, it's kind of like when we talk about war, you know, Jesus, he did have something to say about them doctors of the law. I think somebody just knocked on my truck, y'all. Hold on. Or either seven's eating a ball, one to two. Hold on, I got to go check this out. Take a quick peek. Oh, no. Leave me alone. No. No, that was seven chewing on a ball and then trying to get me to take her outside to the doggy run again. Shit, I ran her little heart out. She was so tired and puffing and huffing or huffing and puffing from throwing the ball. I had to just pick her up, take her back to the truck to let her rest for a minute because she was not going to. She ran herself so much she threw up a little bit. Okay, excuse me. I hope that didn't make anybody um feel some kind of way. Uh, so, yeah, they don't even make this a title right here. I mean, if, granted, they just exposed it. But if it's a title, how come they didn't make a proper noun out of it? Okay. But, again, they make you think it's the collective body that's ruling everything. And it's a title that has to do with something inside the body, okay? But because we don't know these things, people are still, you know, doing magic tricks around here, in my opinion, okay? Um, in my, the way that I'm looking at this, when you say metropolitan, it should have said uh, a bishop metropolitan or a metropolitan bishop or with a hyphen in it that should have been the hyphen talk about um reclassifying the thing okay <laughs> talk about reclassifying it. who went all out she went all. yeah she did yes yeah, seven did okay the metropolitan uh convokes and presides at provincial synagogue synagogues okay and he takes the chief part, assisting, assisted by his suffragans, in, a cons in the consecration of bishops. Wow. Uh-oh. In Slavic-speaking Orthodox churches? Really? Let's see what they say. Um, the title metropolitan is used to designate heads of the autosyphilis or syphilis. 
autocephalous churches and a few important Episcopal, Episcopal sees. Oh, I'm stumbling. In Greek-speaking Orthodox churches, it is given to all di diocesan bishops as distinct from their auxiliaries. In Western medieval Roman Catholicism, especially since the ninth century, the rights of the metropolitans gradually disappeared in the framework of papal centralization, okay? So the vicar of the Pope is gonna turn into the vicar of Christ. Okay, I got you. The title archbishop <laughs> conferred by popes on metropolitans of a particular note took on connotations, denotative, connotative, took on connotations of spiritual authority. And the it took on took on connotations of spiritual authority, so it, it's here. Admit here that they didn't have that at first. Okay, mm -hmm. isms, schisms, and divisions. Uh, and the title metropolitan came to be regarded as being particularly associated with temporal authority. The distinction still remains in the Roman Catholic Church, but in the Church of England. The titles are synonymous. See also Archbishop. Okay, let's go a little bit further. There should be something else down here. Oh, no, we don't know, we'll know about who he is specifically. All right, let's back on up because this is where this study is going to be today. All right, so that was Metropolitan. Now, I got to look at, I saw you put in Alex Ark, but let's look at this word, see if we can get a definition for it. Uh, come on, Doug, Doug, go help me out here. Exarch, a bishop in the Eastern Orthodox Church ranking immediately below a patriarch. Definite, and it's a noun. Uh, number two, the ruler of a providence. Here it is. The ruler of a providence in a Byzantine empire. In the Byzantine empire. Uh-huh. So, so. Yeah, yeah. Byzantine right there in the title um, of Exarch. So now you know what you're looking at when you say Byzantine and when you say Exarch. Got you. Oh, here's another one. Number three, a viceroy. In Rovina, the title of the viceroys of the Byzantine emperors. Mm. In the Eastern Church, the superior over several monasteries. In the modern Greek church, a deputy, wait a minute, it ranks immediately below a patriarch. Okay. Um, in the modern Greek church, a deputy of the patriarch, uh -huh. okay, 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 exarch and those two, exarch, okay, who visits the clergy, investigated ecclesiastical cases, yeah. So in that movie, Stigmata, when the guy came <laughs> to check on the girl that had the stigmata, that was a viceroy, got you. But we would call it a cardinal or try at least that would be the blanket term that we would use because they rank under a bishop and a bishop. Ah, I see the connection. OK, got you. And then uh, what's the other one? The shit that I hated. Linda Blair and the exorcist, exorcist, he came to investigate her head spinning and shit. So he too was a viceroy. Oops. <coughs> <coughs> Royal Society of the Ark Navi. Okay, okay. Uh, like logical left and artistic right hemispheres of the brain. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, what else do we have? Uh-oh, wait, wait. They're going all the way back to... All right, let's go to Exarch for a minute. <laughs> Merriam Webster, we're going to ignore you, okay? Let's move you over here on Exarch. So here's a few things of note when we're looking at Exarch from Wikipedia. What well, it says an Exarch it gives you all that and the Greek name for it and Exarchos and meaning leader. Mm. Mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. You can't get away from this shit if you try. You can act like you ain't religious, but as soon as you say leader, you saying the same shit. Okay. 
but you think we don't know that because that we've been duped or mi misled to think that church and state is separate, separate politics and religion is separate and soul and spirit is separate. Mm, but it ain't. Okay. Anyway, let's go a little bit further. Exarch. Okay. Um, was the holder of any various historical offices, some of them being political or military, and others being ecclesiastical. So now we're talking about political leaders specifically and military leaders as well. Makes me um, kind of understand, if you would, when I was reading that one story that talked about folks were fighting, literally fighting, and nobody would let anybody come through their line but the but the clergy. They one group let the clergy come through their line um, because that person was a religious person, but at the same time, dumbasses, that person was a military person. And that person was political as well. Damn, we got duped. Okay. But but people will sit up here and go, oh, no, we didn't believe like that. And we didn't have this and we didn't have that. I, I'll say it like one sister said it a while ago. All around the world, the same song. We're all eating from the same trough. Miriam, oh, Miriam, where are my gloves? Oops. Merry Morning Webster. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stop talking about Merriam Webster. Okay. Anyway, let's read a little bit more. In the late Roman Empire and early Byzantine Empire, an exarch was a governor. God damn. So our reconstruction period that we're talking about over here in the 1800s, when around the Civil War, people were forced to get out of office and other governors put into place. So you're telling me that those governors were exarchs, exarchs or exarchs right now. Okay. Military, political and ecclesiastical and or ecclesiastical. Yeah. All of the above. Mm -hmm. As I said before, public, private, and secret, public, political, private, military, ecclesiastical, secret. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm, mm. Let's keep going. I'm sorry. I just a study. It's just a study hall. Okay, it's just a study hall. Uh, and there go Italy and the Mediterranean, all that good stuff right there. Yeah. Okay, sit over there. Okay, anyway, uh, let's read a little bit more. Um, an exarch was a governor of a particular territory. From the end of the 3rd century and early or early 4th century, every Roman diocese was governed by a vicarious. <laughs> Just, that is not the way we use that word today, okay? We don't use it as a title. Vicarious in a Latin word meaning substitute or deputy. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It is the root of the English word vicar. Damn. God oh, damn. Mm, mm, mm. Y'all wrong for this shit. Uh, who was titled Exarch in eastern parts of the empire? Mm -hmm. Eastern parts of the empire. And apparently we're in the West, but anyway, never mind. Okay. Um, where the Greek language and the use of Greek terminology dominated, even though Latin was the language of the imperial administration from the provincial level up until the 440s, Greek translations were set out with the official Latin text. Oops. In Greek text, the Latin title is spelled, however you spell that, but pronounced Vicarius, Vicarios, okay, Vicarios. So that P looking thing is an R, got you? Got you, Vicarios, okay. The office of Exarch 
is a governor with extended political and military authority or as a governor. Wait, wait. The office of Exarch as a governor with extended political and military authority was cr later created in the Byzantine Empire with jurisdiction over a particular territory, usually a frontier region at some distance from the capital, Constantinople. Let's go a little further. I'm not going to read all of it. You, you guys know I'm not. I'm just giving y'all little tidbits. Um, hmm. In the Eastern Christian Church, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, or Eastern Catholic, the term exarch has three distinct uses. A metropolitan who holds, office, who holds the office of an exarch is a deputy of a patriarch and holds authority over bishops of an extended ecclesiastical region. Hmm. Thus, with the position between that of a patriarch and a regular metropolitan. So this is the middleman between those two. Okay, exarch right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Slid you right down into the ex-church chambers. Okay, anyway. Um, or an auxiliary or tutelar bishop appointed to be exarch over a group of the faithful not yet large enough or organized enough to be constituted an apache or apache or diocese, thus the equivalent of a vicar apostolic, damn, or a priest <laughs> or a priest or deacon who is appointed by a bishop as his executive representative in various fields of diocesan administration in the Byzantine Empire, executive exarchs were usually collecting diocesan revenues for bishops. So you talking about <laughs> tax collectors? God damn! Who knew? Okay. All right. All right. That goes way back. All they did was bring this shit forward. All they did was bring this shit forward. That's where I grew up, DJ. Um, anyway, uh, political exarchs. We'll get back to the... How long is this one? Uh, Thrice, Caesarea, Pontus, Greek-speaking parts of the year. Okay, we're not going to go that far. We'll just do this one here. Because uh, there go the Lombards. And there's Ravina again. So let's do this section here. <coughs> the Eckhart Exarchet Exarchet of Ravina. The Exarchet of Africa. Really? Of Africa. Hey y'all, how come they don't have America down here? But there go Carthage standing out right around there. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. It was established by Emperor Maurice in 591. Oh, and survived until the Muslim conquest of the Maghrib in the late 7th century. Oops. That part. Okay. Exarp of Ravenna. Oh, up there. Mm hmm. Eastern Roman Empire in Italy from 584 to 751, when the last exarp was put to death by the Lombards. Uh, it was one of two exarchs established following the Western reconquest under Emperor. Y'all know I got to go there. Under Emperor who? Justinian to more effectively administer uh, the territories along with the exarch, exarch of Africa. Let's back on up. Mm -hmm. Hey, Justinian. Y'all remember Django, right? What you say? Not made in Hollywood Church in England. Right, right, right. Um, let me see. In word forming element meaning in e n i n. I'm glad you put that up here, DJ, because you have Indian i n, and then you have Indian e n. Yeah, but people ran right over that when I showed them that last year. Anyway, 
uh, from French and Old French in, from Latin I N in into from uh, Proto uh, Indian. What is it? Proto Indo European root in in typically assimilated before P B M I and R. Latin N became the E N in French, Spanish, Portuguese, but remained I N in Italian. Please don't tell me we speak in Italian. I thought we were speaking a high form of German. My bad. Let me continue. Let me continue. Let me read this here real quick. I'm talking shit. Okay. In this uh, political exarch, in the civil administration of the Byzantine Empire, the exarch was, as stated above, the imperial governor for a large or important region of the empire. The exarch, exarchs, I'm having trouble saying that word, were a response to weakening imperial authority in the provinces and were part of the overall process of unification of civil and military offices initiated in early form by Justinian I, which would lead eventually to the creation of the thematic system by either the emperor Heraclius or Constans II. Yeah, you can say all of that that you want to, but it sounds really familiar to what they were doing here, okay, with the falling of imperial power here and the uniting of, or what they call the Northern aggression, um, the civil war when they wanted to unite the South with the North. It's funny how it's just, it seems like it's so close to us that it would bite us in our neck. Um, themes or themata, thematic system, the themes or themata were the main military and administrative divisions of the Middle Byzantine Empire. They were established in the mid seventh century in the aftermath of the Slavic migrations to Southeastern Europe and the Muslim conquest of parts of the Byzantine territory. And this is interesting because when we were talking about Jutland in Europe, Jutland was in the Southeastern region between Essex, Sussex, and Wessex, if you would. So that's interesting. I'm seeing Slavics over there. Um, what is this? What is this? What is this? Slavic migrations, Muslim, Muslim conquests of parts of the Byzantine territory and replaced the earlier provincial system, establishing the Diocletian and Constantine the Great, established by Diocletian and Constantine the Great. Eastern Roman army, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it, 12th century? Hold on. Let's come down a little bit more. In their origin, this is the uh, democratic system, okay, in the Byzantine Empire. And I'm going to mess up a word. I see it coming. In their origin, the first themes were created from the areas of encampment of the field armies of the East Roman army, and their names corresponded to the military units that had existed in those areas. The theme system, I bet they didn't tell you that in school when they were telling you write a theme paper. <laughs> okay. Was that a military document we were writing? I'm, I'm just saying. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I heard something outside. Uh, the theme system reached its apogee or apogee in the ninth and tenth centuries as older themes, older themes, older themes in the ninth and tenth century mm -hmm, were split up, and the conquest of territories resulted in the creation of new ones. The original theme system underwent significant changes. In the 11th and 12th centuries, when was the Norman Conquest? Yeah, that part. But the term remained in use as a provincial and financial circumscription until the very end of the empire. Yeah, did it end or did it just change names? You know, like Adam 12, the names are hidden to protect the, yeah, whatever. 
Oh, shit. Okay, there go Maurice right there. There go Africa right there. There go the Lombards. The Sassanid Empire. Uh, there go Anatolia. Oh, y'all get on my nerves. This is a long read. Eparchs, Stratolites. <laughs> hey, Israelites, are y'all Stratolites? I know y'all talk about us being straddling the fence and shit. Are y'all Stratolites? My bad. My bad. Background. We'll read a little piece of this. Just hopefully this first paragraph. Okay. Maybe the second. Anyway, uh, during the late 6th and early 7th century, the Byzantine Empire was under frequent attack from all sides. Okay. The Sassanid Empire was pressing from the east on Syria, Egypt, and Anatolia. Slavs and Avars raided Thrace, or Thrace, Thrace Macedonia, Illyricum, um, Illyric, uh, and southern Greece, and settled in the Balkans. Okay, I didn't know that. The Lombards occupied northern huh, Italy largely unopposed. In order to face the mounting pressure in the most distant provinces of the West, recently regained by Justinian I, Emperor Maurice combined some super, uh, supreme civil and military authority in the person of an exarch, a viceroy, forming the exarchite or exarchites, whatever, of Ravenna and Africa. Hmm. Okay. These developments overturned the strict division of civil and military offices, which had been one of the cornerstones of the reforms of the of the of Diocletian. Okay, Said administration restructurings also found a precedence in Justinian's broad reorganization in the Western conquest, denoting combined powers to the newly established. Or they mean stabilized? Okay, established Praetorian perfects of Africa and Italy. Praetorian perfects. I know y'all just gonna repeat what y'all just said right here. Watch this. Administrative division of the Byzantine Empire in the Maghreb, with its seat at Carthage. Mm -hmm. Same place they did the damn Dido story. It was established after the reconquest of the of Northwestern Africa from the Vangles in 533-534. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Well, anyway, we got that. Uh, I just wanted to see a couple. I saw a couple things in there I wanted to take a look at. Chroma, Coma, yeah. Rostrian, as well as the management and fast flexible provincial armies, Asia Minor. Hmm. We're going to keep reading right here, and then we'll back up. Justinian also endowed governors, eparchs, uh, stratolites, of the eastern province plagued with brigadage and foreign invasions with military and administrative powers, formally abolishing the empire's diocese. Or diocese. Diocletian's main administrative structure, but more importantly, he had also created an exceptionally combined military civil circumscription of the Quastura Exorcetus and following the norm abolished that the diocese, the diocese of Egypt, putting a dukes, Greek stratolites, with combined authority at the head of each of the old provinces instead. Uh-huh, a dukes. A leader, a deuce, a deuce, but was not a formal military rank. Okay, he's not okay. And oh shoot, stratolites. Stratolites was a Greek term designating a general, which also became an honor, uh, an honorary dignity in the Byzantine Empire. Hmm. So is that why y'all using Hebrew Israelite and not Stratolus? Because it was it became honorary. Okay, okay, keep playing with us. 
All right. And this one. The Questura Exorcitus was an administrative district of the Eastern Roman Empire with a seat in Odessa, established by Emperor Justinian the First on May 18, 1536. Hmm. Wouldn't that be a bitch if that was Texas? Because, you know, there's an Odessa over here in Texas. Okay. But this is Odessa and not Odessa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Name change. Not saying it's the same. Just paying attention. Okay. Let's continue. Uh, to, or the old provinces instead. The empire maintained this precedent structure until the 640s when the eastern part of the empire faced the onslaught of the Muslim caliphate. The rapid Muslim conquest of Syria and Egypt and consequent Byzantine losses in manpower and territory meant that the empire found itself struggling for survival. In order to respond to this unprecedented crisis, the empire was drastically, drastically, drastically reorganized. As established by the Hellenistic political practice, Hellenistic political practice, philosophies and orthodox doctrines, power had been concentrated in military leaders, Stragoa, who acted as viceroys in their respected Thema, being appointed by the emperor alone. Mm. Their main function around each was the collecting of taxes from different communities, Cora or Chora or Kome, and from the different states, Proastian, Proastian, as well as the management of fast and flexible provincial armies. Sound like some Minuteman thing going on right here. Okay. The remaining remaining imperial territory in Asia Minor in Asia Minor in Asia Minor was divided into four large themes and although some elements of the earlier civil administration survived they were subordinated <laughs> to the governing general or stragoas or strago uh, stratagos so I do see submitting to the nations, all right, the mixing of the military and the religious, which were, but in the reconstruction of what they're doing here, they just lean it towards the religious and not towards the, I mean, the military, the secular, and not towards the religious. Korah. Mm -hmm. Phantoms, phantom duplicates. Okay, I got you, DJ. Okay, and that other one, the Hellenistic, Hellenistic political practice, the dia, uh, dia Dochi, was the rival general, rival generals, families, and friends of Alexander the Great, who fought for control over his empire after his death in 323 B.C. The wars of dia, dia Dochi. Mm -hmm. marked the beginning of the Hellenistic period from the Mediterranean Sea to the Indus River Valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that part. All right, let's back on up. I'm not going to go any further. Uh, if y'all want to look at that, y'all can. This is theme, the Byzantine district, talking about thematic systems. Talking about thematic systems. Where's thematic systems? Okay, we're on Exarch now, backed up to Exarch. Trying to remember where I was. Thematic systems, Justinian. Okay. All right, all right, right in here somewhere. Where's it? Okay, thematic systems is right here. Okay. Next paragraph on Exarch. After the dissolution of the Western Empire in the late 5th century, the Eastern Roman Empire remained stable through the beginning of the Middle Ages and retained the ability for future expansion. Justinian I reconquered North Africa, Italy, Dalmatia, and finally parts of Spain for the Eastern Roman Empire. However, this put an incredible strain on the empire's limited resources. 
subsequent emperors would not surrender. Subsequent empires or emperors would not surrender the reconquered land to remedy the situation. Okay. Thus the stage was set for Emperor Maurice to establish the exarchs to deal with the constantly evolving situation in the provinces. In Italy, the Lombards were the main opposition to Byzantine power. Hmm. Okay. In Northern Africa, there go the Amazid right there. Uh, in Northern Africa, the Amazid or Berber princes were ascendant due to Roman weaknesses outside the coastal cities. In North Africa, the Amazid or Berber princes were ascendant due to the Roman weakness outside the coastal cities. Okay, that's where Amorican is coming in at. The problems associated with many enemies on various fronts, the Visigoths in Spain, the Slavs and Avars in the Balkans, the Sassanid Persians in the Middle East, and the Amazid in North Africa, forced the imperial governor to decentralize and devolve power to the former provinces. Okay, okay, of ours. Pannonian, Pannonian avars were an alliance of several groups of Eurasian nomads of various origins. The people were also known as the Abri. In Chronicles of Rus, the Aburai or Varchonite or Pseudo-Avars in Byzantine sources, and Apar in the Gokturts. Mm, okay. Okay, so that's where that is. Got you. And we're still dealing with that area right over there with the Black Sea. Okay, and we saw some people coming from over there and sliding over into, uh, what's the place? Above Saudi Arabia and, and all of that. Okay, okay, I got you. All right, let's back up. What's this about Slavs? A group of people who speak Slavic languages. Northern part of Eurasia. Dominate uh, predominantly inhabited Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and Southeastern Europe, though there is a large Slavic minority scattered across the Baltic, more than likely. Okay. And then Sassanid Persians, uh, Sassanian Empire or Sassanid Empire, also known as the Second Persian Empire or Neo Persian Empire was the last Iranian empire before the early Muslim conquest of the 7th and 8th centuries. Named after the House of Sassan, it endured for over four centuries, from 224 to 651, making it bubble, whatever it made it, okay? All right. Ah, dang it. Sorry, y'all. Uh, making it the second longest-lived Persian imperial dynasty after the Arkhasids, of the Parthian Empire. Okay. Okay. All right. We back up. How y'all doing in the chat? The Blue Turks. Gawk Blue Turks. Okay. Got you. Amorican. Mm-hmm. Swan Knights. You know that swan happens to fall kind of in line with something over here. Um, the principle of, yes, right to denounce your faith for survival. Hmm. Hmm. That's going to tie into the Jews uh, when they talk about them. It was some legislation that finally hit in the early 1900s over here. And it is a direct it is the direct reason why when we call ourselves swearing on the Bible, you know, or swearing, if you would, they say, do you swear or affirm? 
in relationship to what you said, a right to denounce your faith that goes right into the Jewish one that we find over here, late 18th century, early 19th century, that leads to us now having the option to swear or affirm because they were dealing with those people. Yeah, we'll leave that alone. Okay. Um, and of course, that comes after the little infighting, if you would, if I'm correct, the little infighting between the Scots and the Irish. Uh, let's continue. Where were we at? Mm -hmm. Okay, the centralized power. Okay, the term exarch most commonly referred to the exarchs of Italy who governed the area of Italy and Dalmatia, still retain, uh, remaining under Byzantine control after the Lombard invasion of 568. The exarch seat was at Ravenna. Which um, which is known as the exarch, exarchate, whatever, of Ravenna. And I, I'm thinking, from memory, Italy. Yes, Italy. Okay, Ravenna, Italy. Got you. Ravenna remained the seat of the exarch until the revolt of 727 over iconoclasts. Thereafter, the growth, the growing menace of the Lombards, and the split between the eastern and western split between Eastern and Western Christendom that iconoclast caused, made the position of the Exarch more and more untenable. The last Exarch was killed by the Lombards in 751. The second Exarch uh, was created by Maurice to administer Northern Africa, formerly a separate Praetorian prefecture, the islands of the Western Mediterranean and the Byzantine possessions in Spain. The capital of the Exarch of Africa was Carthage. <laughs> okay. An empire of the Eastern Roman Empire, Hercules, Heraclius, was the son of the Exarch of Africa. Hold on. An emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire, emperor, empire Heraclius, was the son of of the Exarch of Africa before Heraclius replaced the usurper emperor Phacos in 610. Who the hell is that? Damn, almost look like Cujo. Um, Phocas was the Byzantine Empire from 602 to 610. Initially a middle-ranking officer in the Eastern Roman army, Phocas rose to prominence as a spokesman for the dissatisfied soldiers in their disputes with the court of the Emperor Maurice. Got you. We'll leave that alone. Mm -hmm. Just infighting on top of infighting, huh? Uh, Focos had revolted under Emperor Maurice, who had appointed her Heraclius' father as Ecar Exarch of Africa. The Exarch proved both financially and militarily strong and survived until the Arab Muslim conquest of Carthage in 694, the Arab Muslim conquest of Carthage in 698, my bad, 698. All right. Uh, I don't want to read no more of that. Let's back on up, even though I see Jerusalem down there. Y'all can read more if y'all want to. Wait a minute. When the proposed government of universal Christendom by five patriarchal sees, Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, known as the Pentarchy. I, wait a minute. I thought the Pentarchy was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, even if not in that order. Oh. I, yeah, okay. Under the auspices of a single universal empire, was formulated in the legislation of Emperor Justinian I, especially in his novella, 131, 131. Okay, ecclesiastical law, okay, and received formal ecclesiastical sanction at the Council of Trula in 692. The name Patriarch became the official one for the heads of major autocephalous cephalous churches, and the title of Exarch was further demoted by naming all metropolitans as patriarchal Exarchs. 
in their ecclesiastical provinces. Interesting, interesting. Sorry, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole too much. Sixth Ecumenial Council. The Sixth Ecumenial Council. Okay. Yeah, the Council of Trullo. All right, let's back on up. Okay, let's back on up. Um, we looked up Exart, so I got to take y'all back over to Britannica and finish reading here. Y'all good in the chat? Okay. Just a little study, just a little study, y'all. Just a little study. So Exarch, and then, of course, Patriarch. And I really don't want to look up Patriarch because I think we already know that it's the title position. So let's just leave that alone. So let's start back at sentence again. Um, in the early church, it was one of several titles, including Metropolitan, Exarch, and Patriarch used to designate a chief bishop who had certain rights of superintendence over an entire district or area. Through gradual development, it became primarily an honorary office. As I said before, you can't get up from where you didn't fall down, as has been said before. And I'm remembering a book that I have um, with my books that was so unkept that every time you turn the page, it um, focus. Okay. That every time you turn the page, the, the page broke off from the binding. And um, I forgot the name of the book. You know, I'm, I'm bad on names, but what it talked about was like over here in what we would call like the civil, the revolutionary war period. And it talked about, churches that were here regardless of what you officially called them but it talked about churches that was over here in north america that ended up being used as military strongholds during the war and then after the war they never returned to their original um denomination okay which means some people got knocked down literally knocked the fuck down OK, and that may be one of the reasons why when we start to look at this, like when I looked at the kings, I went all over the place looking at the for the kings. I'm looking for the kings over here. OK. But. Um, in that, it's like, you know, I'm looking at those European kings overwhelmingly and then noticing that when they talk about the kings over here, they only mention three. And possibly one king, one queen, Elizabeth II or something like that, um, or Victoria, or what, whatever it was, but um, either or, or both. But the kings that I'm looking for, I'm not seeing. OK, and I'm thinking that the reason why we might not see those is because of what existed prior to the Revolutionary War that did not make it into the official history books to make us lean toward what was going on in Europe so that like like the word primate we lean toward it being a monkey based on how the word was structured but not knowing the history the title because you know they said they can't bestow any titles over here um you know th that being a religious title and so being that some of those buildings, some of those, uh, quote, with quotation marks, churches, establishments, orders were knocked down. That's probably the reason why we, um, again, lean toward other things like the Exarch of Africa or the um, Arab conquest, Muslim conquest of that area, uh, or even uh, the European Church of um, England. You said, what do it perplex the beloved sister? Oh, wait, what, what's going on? Okay, so you talking then. Okay. <laughs> you're focusing, you're just confused. Okay, all right. Anyway, um, let's go a little bit further. That went all the way back to the 600s, all the way back to 425 or 325 council, 600s, 700s, 800s, uh, 900s came in there, 11 and 1200s was also in there, bringing it back forward. 
11, 12th century. This is when they're using that word primary in um, shit. The French language, if you would, and also the Latin language, if you would. But when it comes over here, meaning primate, when it comes over here into the English language, we're not looking at it as a religious title. We're looking at it as monkeys in the fucking zoo and evolution. Losing the scientific part of it, you can't get up from where you didn't fall from. Okay. All right, so... Let's go a little bit further. Y'all know I talk in a certain rhythm, so you got to catch my rhythm and then really think about what I'm trying to say. And hopefully you have something to add it to to understand that. But let's go a little bit further. OK, how far did we get? Um, patriarchs and chief bishops, blah, blah, blah. Primarily. OK, though, gradual development, it became primarily an honorary office because they can't confer titles over here. All right. In the modern Roman uh, Catholic Church. Primates are those metropolitan archbishops whose sees, by reason of antiquity or prominence, are the primary sees of a region or a nation. It makes sense. Treaty of Verona, they're trying to um, uh, submit the nations. I got you. Apart from the special case of the Pope, who has among his titles that of primate of Italy, Primates generally do not possess any jurisdiction outside their own diocese, but only a limited and honorary right to precedence. So um, why would we get all up in arms? And the Pope said, the Pope said, this, it's only in his jurisdiction. You must be in the Pope's jurisdiction. Oh, <laughs> OK, OK, America girl. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Somebody told me when I put that thing up there with the blue and white and the red and, and the red and white, there's going to be some issues. But yeah, I see you. Okay. All right. I'm a girl. Okay. So let's go a little bit further. In the Church of England, the Archbishop of York is the primate of England, whereas the Archbishop of Canterbury, not that man again, or that title again, is the primate of the entire Anglican communion. <laughs> what you say, can't bury, uh, what you say, can't bury the other day? So that's Anglican. Oh, okay. We got to go that way. Now this one, I saw this earlier. I, I think it's going to, yeah, I want to read this one here. Okay, there's Metropolitan. And I want to say Primate might come up in here not primate um propaganda hold on yeah we gonna we gonna do this i don't want to know what the ministry is okay where's primate i don't even know who that is what did you say about some testament what you say what you say the old testament DJ, tell me this is the usher in the Bible or Asher in the Bible. Tell, tell me that ain't who this is right here. I'm just saying. Y'all got to stop playing with us. Okay, let me go a little bit further. Let me, it's something in here. Spanish arch. It's not, in, okay, I'm going to have to look up propaganda somewhere else just like we looked up. Um primate but let me go back up before the punic and, and runic divide mm. okay where we at all right so here was another dude when i was looking at this i was like okay that's interesting i might need to read that okay but um i found this one interesting as i read a little bit and it might have the word propaganda in this one. I'm not sure. Yeah, there it is right there. Okay, that's where propaganda comes in at. I want to show you all that too. Okay, so St. Oliver Plunkett, that comes in next. 
St. Oliver Plunkett. This is from Britannica. So it says, Oliver, uh, St. Oliver Plunkett, born 1629, La Croix, Count Meath, Ireland, died June, July the 1st, 1681 in London. He's canonized in 1975. Feast day is July 11th. So his feast day is coming up. It says he was a Roman Catholic primate of all Ireland. So we got an all Hungria, we got an all souls, and we got an all Ireland so far, okay? Um, and the last man to suffer martyrdom for the uh, Catholic faith in England. Plunkett was educated and ordained in Rome, serving there as professor of theology at the College of Propaganda Phi and as the representative of Irish bishops at the Holy See, appointed Archbishop of Armagh and primate of all Ireland in 1669, three years after the Pope says uh, he claimed all souls, okay? He arrived in the following year at a time when after prolonged repression, the Catholic Church was greatly disorganized and only one aged bishop at liberty, setting himself to restore order and discipline in ordinance in accordance with the precepts of the Council of Trent. Plunkett kept on good terms with the English and the Protestants until in 1673, when under renewed persecution, he was obligated to go into hiding. For the next five years, he labored under the conditions of increasing difficulty, brought to a climax by the terror inspired by the Titus Oates plot of 1678, and I think we read that at one point. In the following year, he was betrayed, arrested, and imprisoned in Dublin Castle. Uh, his trial in Dundalk was made absurd by the ignominious witnesses for the persecution. Uh, ignorant? Should be ignorant. Oh, come on. Ah, shit. Sorry, y'all. Humiliating degrading, deserving shame or infamy. Okay, got you. Got you. I thought it was just ignorance. Okay. Uh, he was taken to London where he, after protracted legal proceedings, he was sentenced to be hanged, disemboweled and quartered. That's worse than life plus 10 years. Okay. I'm just sad. That's crazy. Okay. And 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 you know what's, what's really just think about this for a minute, okay? Father, Son, Holy Ghost, triune nature. Um, uh, what's, what's the other one? The whole damn triangle itself. Uh, public, private, secret, okay? I got to ask, even though they're long gone and past, but I got to ask, if you hang a person and kill them, why do you need to disembowel them and then quarter them too? Hmm. It just it sounds like overkill. What y'all talking about? Okay, naming themselves after lands, Jim and C. Pledge of Cyprus. Okay, okay. Let's go a look. That that just seems like overkill to me. It's like it just 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 shoot them dead. <laughs> just one time, shoot them, bury them. Is it okay? <laughs> let God sort it out. Is that what they're saying when they say quarter them too? Let God sort it out? God damn. Anyway, let's continue. My bad. I'm just joking. The sentence was carried out at uh, Tyburn before a large crowd. Remember, a hundred. Everybody had to attend, and it was for a trial. Okay? So this is a, you're looking at a hundred right here. Okay? The wealthiest families get together and blah, 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 blah. That's why the schedule for one. All right. Anyway, let me let me continue. Uh, Plunkett was uh, beatified by Benedict the 15th in 1920 and canonized by Pope Paul the 6th on October 12th, 1975. His head is preserved at, at uh, Drakita and his body at Downside Abbey near Bath. You know, that's that's messed up. Okay, that's worse than the Scottish. They can only be one and taking your head off. They take your head to one country and take your body to another one. That's crazy. 
Okay, let's go back to um propaganda. I want y'all to see this real quick. Okay. Check this out. Y'all thought propaganda was just this message that you give? Come on, y'all. Let me let me in there all the way. I wanna actually see y'all get on my nerves. Check this out. Propaganda. Let's go to the full definition <laughs> with Merriam Webster. Propaganda. Okay. Capitalized. Capitalized propaganda. Okay. A congregation of the Roman Curia having jurisdiction over missionary territories and related institutions. Is that what we mean when we say that it's propaganda when we're talking about it online? Hell no. We're just talking about fake and false stuff. And it's actually a religious order. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it gets it gets lost in translation. Because propaganda can be anything when we don't identify the thing, <laughs> the assembly, to which it came from, which is this church shit. Okay. Number two, see, we take that's what we do. We take the second definition. But you know how people talk about, hey, what was the first definition of an Indian? In all the uh, the copper color races, peoples, co copper color peoples that were here when the Europeans got here, but it now um, given to the European. So you see the same thing here. Propaganda was actually dealing with the Roman Curia, but now. Uh, given to the second definition the spreading of ideas information or rumor for the person for the purpose of helping or injuring what an institution a cause or a person mm -hmm. and then number three ideas facts and allegations spread deliberately to further one's cause or to damage an opposing cause okay a public action having such an effect we're taking definition two and three you know the son and the Holy Ghost, but not the daddy. Okay? Because the daddy is the Roman courier. And the Roman courier is dealing with the isms, schisms, and divisions that happen over there and the wars that happen in conjunction with it. And the secret orders, private orders, and secret religious se sections, if you would, so associated with it. Keep that in mind when you hear people go propaganda again. Let's read this down here. OK, see what they say here. Uh, the history of propaganda. Propaganda today is today most often used in reference to political statements. But the word comes to our language through its use in a religious context. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It comes to us. that Yeah. Just like when you go and you write a law. I mean, not a law, but you go to appeal. Now comes um here comes or now comes so and so so and so to present some case or appeal. Same shit, because that's how it came to the language. But we don't know law because we fell up under. <laughs> Let me, you know, we don't know law because we fell up under it. Like I said in the past couple of weeks, they dropped us so low that the only thing they gave us to hold on to was religion. Okay, you know, but but. In this aspect, religion is like what they talk about as far as the elephant is concerned. You got people holding the elephant, touching the elephant. So the, the story goes, touching the elephant from different angles and thinking it's something different. Somebody's got the trunk. Somebody got the leg. Somebody got the tail. Somebody got the ear. They think it's something different. It's the same fucking elephant in the room. Okay. <laughs> right, DJ. <coughs> Excuse me, DJ. You know we got to catch up with you, okay? So let's read some more. Um, it says the congre uh, Congregatio de Propaganda Feed, or FIDE, whichever, Congregation for Propagating the Faith, F-I-D-E is faith, okay? Confide, confaith. Uh huh. Okay, got you. Confide, uh, propaganda fied. Uh, Congregation for Propagating the Faith was an organization established in 1622 by Pope Gregory the Fifteenth 
as a means of furthering Catholic missionary activity. The word propaganda is from the oblative singular feminine of propagandus, which is the gerundive, whatever that means, of the Latin prop propagari, meaning to propagate. Mm -hmm. The first use of the word propaganda without the rest of the Latin title in English is in reference to this Catholic organization. It was not until the beginning of the 19th century that it began to be used as a term denoting ideas and information that are of questionable accuracy as a means of advancing a cause. Now, I want somebody to justify why we shouldn't read books again. All right. Examples of propaganda uh, in a sentence. Let me see. She didn't buy into the propaganda of her day that women had to be soft and submissive. Yeah, that part. Um, they see all clear thinking, all sense of reality, and all fineness of living, living threatened on every side by propaganda, by advertisement, by film and television. Yes, C.S. Lewis. I used to read his stuff, some of his stuff. Uh and and if you if you don't understand why I'm reading this, like I have the um, I think it's the American Standard uh, Dictionary in the volumes, which I really need to get that dictionary set out of my storage, because um, when you're reading the definition, it gives you buku amounts of words and um, in the definition that go along with the word, but also what's added in that uh, good unabridged dictionary is where these particular phrases show up at in history. For example, for those of you who have been in some of the circles, and I know we've all been in the same circle to a certain extent, if not at the same time and at the same place, but um, if you remember, there is a statement that um, talked about the Englishmen, and the quote was, um, the Englishman saying they are not uh, mere hybrids or something to that point. Uh, when I, I, I bought the dictionary, got it at a, a library sale, and was looking through that book and looked into whatever that definition was, it's probably Englishman. And upon reading that, then I found the quote. I was like, oh, I didn't hit a gem. And, and if y'all understand that gem, that gym only cost me, I believe, $15 for that multi-volume set, okay? So I, I got a good hit on that one right there because uh, we were told basically to um, – I'm not going to go into that because we were told um, to rebuild our libraries, okay? Um, okay, so – that's about enough for that. But I wanted y'all to see where propaganda came from so that we can understand the difference between the two, just like primate and evolution and creationism. We can understand the nuances, with the difference between the two and not mistake one conversation that we're having for another conversation that we should be having. OK, they dropped us so far low that only thing they gave us to hold on to was religion, but it wasn't clear uh, what that was. So now what we do, we reject the whole damn thing and don't understand that all around the world, the same song, we was in this shit too. Okay? And what they destroyed has to do with these old orders that need to be reestablished here in our time. But shh, you didn't hear that from me because I'm pretty sure some people going to jump up and start saying the same thing that I said, you know, kind of like the brother that was talking about, you know, a bowl of nuts, all the nuts coming together, and if they, you know, they can bring in the fruit because they got opposition with the vegetables. Yeah, I heard that. Uh-huh. I heard that. Uh-huh. Um, Ophius. There was a brother who told me to look. He asked me, what did I think about this particular book? Let me let me see if I can find it real quick. Oh, a, 
don't know. Oshi? I thought it was, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me bring y'all here real quick. Just to, um, what do they have for meanings on this? Oh, uh, speed. Is this it? Uh, yes. Okay. Brother asked me what I thought about this particular Bible. And I told him I hadn't read it, but he did give me the link for it. Okay. And so it's on my phone. And luckily, I can listen to it while I'm uh, driving down the road. Okay. But I was listening to this and I was trying to explain this to um to find trees. Uh, but I did send her the link so she could also look at it as well. Okay. Let's see. Sacred text. Let's see if it's gonna bring it up. Hoo-hoo. Y'all wrong for this one. Okay. So let me bring y'all over real quick and then we'll bounce back. Okay. Uh, it's this word right here. Okay, can't click it. Internet Sacred Text Archive. Nope, let's not even go to that one. Let's just back up. Okay, but this first word is the name of the Bible. O-A-H-S-P-I. Okay, so I started to look in this book because I hadn't gotten back to it since we're talking about religion. Um, to a certain extent, primate, okay, you know, and 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 those bishops of old were really scientists, as opposed to just mere undercover military men, polit uh, politicians, and pretending to be, you know, other things, you know. Uh, anyway, um, so anyway. I started to uh, listen to the audio book of this or the, the, the um, what do you call this? Well, yeah, the audio of the book. And I'm not sure how far I got into it because I was just listening to it and almost falling asleep. All right. But as I was going through some of these books, let me see if they show you any, let's see if it has anything in there. Okay. So I was I was going through this and I started to see the same pattern. And I told Tracy, I said, I had to stop listening to it because I wasn't sure that if it was what this this understanding that I'm coming to right now about it, that I was seeing it through. And um, I'm not sure if it was what I wanted to be there or if it was really what was there. But I could have swore that as I was reading through this, that this looked like them reestablishing an order. Okay? It just seems like they're, when I say reestablish your orders, it just looks like in coded language they were reestablishing their orders as opposed to in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and, a little, 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 and all that stuff that nobody was there for. OK. And it just makes me think that all of this is about different orders that are established. But we have people who are they got a stronghold on it. Politicians got a stronghold on it. The government's got a stronghold on it. Masonry has a stronghold on it. Um, I would say the Moors and, and Hebrews and different factions are dealing with these different orders but at the same time the masses are clueless to how you fell from your orders and um in my opinion over the past centuries or should i say decades i can't speak centuries but over the past decades people are being duped to fall into certain organizations and social social structures that um, are working against them behind the scenes because of the propagation, uh, propaganda, first definition, and propaganda as well, third definition, okay? Um, 
but I found this interesting, and it looks like this date is 1882, so that's really interesting. Why would y'all do that in 1882 unless you were trying to establish a particular order? No difference from Pactum de Salarium de Singularis, establishing an order for a group of people. Get y'all families back together. It says, oh, the word is defined as sky, earth, copair, and spirit, sky, earth and spirit sky earth and spirit okay the all the sum of the corporal mm -hmm, and the spiritual knowledge at present was published in 1882 yes 1882 pe the word defined as sky earth corporal uh where'd it go dang dj where'd you go okay 1882 did you do that twice awesome knowledge of the present published okay got that uh new works stated uh, started writing the book in 1880 and stated that it was um, that the writing was done automatically. He had been in a spiritualist since the early 1700s. Now, when you say it was done automatically, what that puts me in mind of DJ is um, the prayer book. When I ran into the prayer book when I was still in church, looking at you know just stumbling across a little bit of a history in there. Uh, some people deemed automatic writing as demonic. Um, as a writer and poet, I've I've never done that. I don't see it as demonic because you know, yeah, I don't open myself up like that. I don't even think I can open myself up like that. But um. Some people deemed it as demonic, but I remember stumbling across that information with the um, prayer book. Now, that prayer book also, it has a history of when it was written and why it was written. I just can't remember what it is. OK, but here we go here again. And and the only thing that I would add here, I know it's a brother out here whose avatar is J-E-H-O-V-I-H, as opposed to what we would see in the King James Version of the Bible, J-E-H-O-V-A-H, okay? And um, I don't know if that was the brother that, that said it or not. It might have been someone else. But it was some interesting stuff in here, okay? I Like I said, I didn't read all of it, but, you know, it doesn't start out in the beginning, blah, blah, blah. It starts out after the creation of man, meaning there's other stuff going on already, Look at the books that you already have and now add this to that, okay, to see what you can pull out of it. Um, so the work of my hand, I have written the uh, capacity for knowledge, power, and dominion. This is the first era. So you see first era. It's telling you what that first era is, almost kind of helping you define other things, even though I know some people don't agree. The second era, um, and the angels of heaven descended on earth and raised man upright. And man, see, that's Masonic, uh, and man wondering about the earth, this was the second era, kind of telling you what's going on, moving around. Jehovah said the angels that were with man, behold, man hath multiplied on the earth, mm -hmm. uh, bring them together, it's establishing an order, teach them to dwell in cities and nations, okay, Wh whose authority are you going to come under? Bishop, a primate, same shit, okay. And the angels of Jehovah taught the people of the earth and dwelt together in cities and nations. This is the third era. OK, now, if we if I would take it this way, trying to bring it back into science or because, you know. In, in my opinion, if you can find the pattern, you can find the protocol. So I, what I would take is when we say six, 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 when we say um, electron, neutron and proton uh one of the things that i ran across is that there is a fourth part and i want to say that that's equated to antimatter but um, i'm not sure about that part um, but there's another a fourth part of the proton neutron and electron i just can't remember what that title was for it so if you if they're giving us three here the fourth is something that we might not see in my opinion so check this out it says number six, and in that same time, the beast, and see, they're calling the beast self. So 
if this is a mindset of some people and we're out here talking about we banging on the beast, would that mean that we're banging on ourselves? Okay. Isn't don't that make us all mentally ill? I'm just saying. Banging on yourself, trying to pull your own self up, but let's read. And in that same time, the beast self rose up before a man and spanked to him. I don't know. Ego. I don't know. Whatever. Um, possess saying, Pos possess thou whatsoever thou wilt, for all things are thine and are good for thee. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Jump in a volcano. See how good that is for you. Uh, seven. And man obeyed the beast. Man obeyed himself. OK. And guess what? And war came into the world. Oops. And that's the fourth part. OK. But anyway, I was checking this out and it just seems like they're bringing in um, an order. OK. Another order, if you would. OK. Now, look at this. Eleven. And the beast divided itself into four great heads and possessed the earth about. Now, it told you about four pieces over there or four divisions over there. OK, but now it's saying, you know, the, the beast did this. OK, and possessed the earth and men fell down and worshiped them. OK, they dropped us so low that the only thing that they gave us to hold on to was religion. And we think religion is praising and worshiping and bowing down to and paying tithes or, you know, all that shit. Spook God or whatever the case is, when in actuality. Um, it's studying, it's science, uh, the different sciences, it's the noble arts. It's not what people have been reduced to, ritualistic, institutionalized um, idolatry. Okay. 12. And the names of the heads of the four beasts were Brahmin, Buddhist, Christianity, and Mohammedism. Oops. And they divided the earth and appointed it between themselves, choosing soldiers and standing armies for the maintenance of their earthly aggrandizement. Isn't that what we just read about the um, exarch, the exarch? Okay. Isn't that really what we just freaking read? Okay. Leaving off the Brahmin and the Buddhists, just talking about the Mohammedan and the Christian for the most part. Okay. Uh. I don't know how accurate this is, but like I said, as I read this, okay, mm, um, as I read this, it just looked like an order was being established. Look at 14. Jehovah called out, <laughs> called out to man to desist from evil. So some evil shit, war, okay, war is going on. Wait, wait. Let's go back. Let's go back to 13. OK, 13. And the Brahmins had seven million soldiers and the Buddhists 20, 20 million and the Christians seven million. And the Mohammedans two millions whose trade was killing man. Ain't that some shit? OK. And man in service of the beast himself gave one sixth of his life and his labor to war and standing armies and one third of his life he gave to dis dissipation and drunkenness. And that's the sixth era. You're a man, if you would put it like that. Now watch this. Jehovah called out to man to desist from evil, but man heard him not. For the cunning of the beast had changed man's flesh so that his soul was hid as if in a cloud and he loved sin. You think it's sin when you call yourself a primate and don't know where it came from? Or argue over being a primate and don't understand the history because you refuse to read the history of the book or share the real knowledge with the people so that they can become free, mind, body, and soul? Man heard him not, okay? Anyway, let me move out of this. It was some stuff in there. I was like, that's 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 interesting, you know. Um, but again, it sounded like they were setting up an order. I haven't decided if it was a good one or a bad one, um, as we go on, but look at here, the, the book, the first book of the first Lords. Okay. It's like, Oh, that'd be interesting. Okay. 
And look at this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the Lord made and the Lord made man upright and man was naked and not ashamed. Neither knew man the sin of incest, but he dwelt as the beast of the field. Mm. Mm. Let me just read a couple. I just see something in here. I know it's probably waning on you, but let me read a couple. Um, and the Lord brought the angel, brought the angels of heaven to man. By his side took they on forms like unto man, having all the organs and attributes of mortals. For, um, for it was the time of the earth for such a thing to be. And it came to pass that a new race was born on the earth. <laughs> and these were called ions. Because they were begotten of both heaven and earth. Hence it became a saying. The earth conceived of the Lord. The earth conceived of the Lord. Anyway, man thought about God. Anyway, let me move on out of there. Let me go on and go back. Okay. Um, but if you I, I just thought about that book. Okay. Just thought about that. And, and, you know, what it looked like to me. I haven't really gotten all the way into it. To see what's there because, you know, some of this shit will put you in a fucking trance. what you say? Sindhu, Hindu, A-I-O-U. Uh-huh. <laughs> somebody owes somebody something. <laughs> let me stop. Let me stop. Okay. Uh, where are we at? We're at St. Oliver. Okay, St. Oliver. Are we back here? Yeah, let me bring y'all back over here. Just the thought I had um, coming off of that propaganda um, and again, sticking with the same vein, just be careful out there. Be careful out there. Okay. So we did this one, which is metropolitan. Um, I don't think it's a real big need to do, uh, what was that? Ecclesiastical title bishop or whatever that was. Was that bishop? Archbishop. Yeah. Uh, this one was um, kind of interesting, may not be too interesting for you guys, but you have something called a wandering bishop. In Cre Christianity, a bishop without authority. Oh, <laughs> hey, Hebrew Israelites, are y'all wandering bishops? <coughs> okay, I am chain smoking now. So anyway, uh, wandering bishops. In Christianity, a bishop without authority or without recognition in any major Christian church. Such bishops may have received an irregular consecration by another bishop and may and they may have been properly consecrated or they may have been properly consecrated, but lack a diocese or were excommunicated by their church. Okay, a Jehovah Witnesses. Anyway, my bad. I didn't say that out loud. My bad. Uh, in the early Christian church, wandering bishops were a problem, primarily because some bishops were consecrated but were not given jurisdiction over a diocese. In addition, theological controversies in the 4th and 5th centuries often resulted in bishops being deprived of their sees. They retained their consecration as bishops but had to wander to make a, um, a, live, a livelihood, to make a living. Okay, In latter times, uh, the number of wandering bishops was increased by bishops driven out of their diocese by war, especially in Spain. Especially where? Especially where? In Spain. Or by bishops consecrated for dioceses controlled by Muslims who would not allow Christian bishops to take up residence. Mm -hmm, that part too. The activities of wandering bishops were not restricted in the Roman Catholic Church until after the Council of Trent in the 1500s. Ah, so when we talk about the early 1500s and things that happened in 1536 and those narratives, like we were looking at one of the kings, and I can't remember where he, he was. I think he was here in the Americas. That shows up, I think, 1505 or something like that. So, uh, so we got to tie the Council of Trent to that. To see what it moved into, uh, more than likely, yes, because this is where, uh, I'm sorry, I'm answering my own questions. Uh, Pris, what was it? Picpus. Or Picpus? 
or something like that. That's where that title was going to come in at of the Romans and down there in South America, the Roman Catholic Church down there in South America, the missionaries. That's where that's going to come in at. So that's going to touch on that. OK. All right. All right. All right. Y'all still here? Yes. A few of y'all still here. I'm pretty sure somebody went live. Let's read a little bit more. And then uh, what are we at? Oh, yeah, I'm over by 30 minutes. I only wanted to do this for two hours. So let me just finish uh, reading this section and then we're going to get on out of here. This, like I said, this was just a little generic study right here just to put it on the record and, and really understand that primates are not monkeys. OK, the whole monkey, the whole primary uh, humans are monkeys. Is a it's a monkey trick. <laughs> yeah, OK, it, it, it's a trick. It's a trick. It's a trick on language and your psyche. Okay. In modern times, when wandering bishops, many wandering bishops have appeared who are outside the control of any ecclesiastical order. Most of these wandering bishops trace their succession to one of three men consecrated in the late 19th and early 20th century centuries. The first of these was Jules Ferret or Foray, a former Roman Catholic priest who claimed to have been consecrated in 1866 by the Jacobite Bishop of Homs, Syria. He worked in England and the United States. Looks like we need to look at him. Jose René Vallat, a lapsed French Catholic who had worked in the Protestant Episcopal Church Damn, in Wisconsin, was consecrated in 1892 by the Metropolitan of the Independent Catholic Church of Ceylon, Goa, and India. Uh -huh, by the Bishop of the Independent Catholic Church of Ceylon, Goa, and India. Yeah, remember, a Metropolitan is a title. It's a person, not just an order. All right. Arnold Harris Matthew, a former Roman Catholic priest, was consecrated in 1908 in Utrecht, Netherlands, by old Catholic bishops. Old Catholic bishops. How old are they? Um, his consecration was later described as having been obtained by misrepresentation, and he was reputed, repudiated by the old Catholics. He tried unsuccessfully to create an old Catholic movement in England. And that's, ooh, that, that's, that's interesting. Okay. Okay, hold on. Old Catholic Church of the Netherlands. Wonder what your history is. Y'all got a date? Okay, let's read that for a minute since I don't know much about the Netherlands. Old Catholic Church of, of the Netherlands, small independent Roman Catholic Church in the Netherlands that's, that dates from the early 18th century. A schism, mm -hmm. a schism developed in the Roman Catholic Church in Holland in 1702 when Petrus or Petrus Cody or Code Archbishop of Utrecht was accused of heresy for suspected sympathy of a Jansenism with, Jan with Jansenism, a heresy emphasizing God's grace and predestination, which was condemned by Pope Alexander VII in 1656. Many of the Dutch clergy and laity remained loyal to Cody and left the Roman Catholic Church. Several French Genesis subsequently settled in Holland and joined the small group of Dutch Genesis. Almost sounds like the same story we visited. In 1723, uh, the church elected Cornelius Steenhover as its bishop and was subsequently consecrated by the missionary bishop of ba Babylon. Really? Babylon? Shouldn't that name be gone by the 1700s? In 1723, the church elected Cornelius Steenhover as its bishop, and he was subsequently consecrated by the missionary bishop of Babylon, Dominique Mary Vallée. 
or Marie Vallée. Marie Vallée. Okay. Um, the church bases its claims to be apostolic succession of its bishops upon this event. How long is this stuff? Mm. Though never large, the church continued in Holland and became important in the old Catholic movement after 1870, when many Roman Catholics disagreed with the decision concerning papal infallibility reached by the First Vatican Council. I remember reading about that. Groups that left the Roman Catholic Church organized national Catholic churches in, in several countries and received consecration of their bishops from a bishop of the Genesis Church of Holland. In the 20th century, that's interesting. In the 20th century, the All Catholic Church of the Netherlands has an archbishop at Utrecht and two bishops at Deventer in Haarlem. Haarlem. Okay. Yeah, over there. Um, the liturgy had been in the Dutch language since 1910. And in 1922, the requirement of clergy celibacy was discontinued. Oh, shit, everybody start fucking. Uh, the Archbishop of Utrecht presided at meetings in the Union of Utrecht and the organization formed in 1889 of all old Catholic bishops, which is accepted as the highest authority for all Catholics. Is that like old settlers? No, nah, I'm just kidding. In the late 20th century, the old Catholic Church of the Netherlands reported 12,000 members. Okay, that's a repeat. Okay, a couple of names in there that I need to look at. Predestination and, and uh huh. Okay, so after the council, all the bishops of the oppos of the opposition one by one gave in their adhesion to the new dogma. Dahlinger remained inflexible and in time was excommunicated by name. He himself took no part in forming separatist churches, but it was largely as a result of his advice and guidance that old, church, old Catholic churches came in, into being in a number of countries, Germany, Switzerland, Australia, and elsewhere, or Austria, and elsewhere. As no bishop had joined any of these groups, recourse was had to the Janus Church in Holland which had maintained a somewhat precarious existence in separation from Rome since the 18th century, but have preserved an Episcopal succession recognized by Rome. Ah, oh, shit. Excuse my language, y'all. Um. I know I'm all over the place. We're supposed to be dealing with the monkey trick. Yeah, that's what Navi poet means. Well, that's what somebody said. It's called night vision. That's what Navi means. Well, Navi poet, that's what it means. Night vision poetry. As well as other things. Okay. And and when I brought that to some people at my church, they did ask me about, you know, they said, what, was I going to have some kind of speakeasy? I said, no, I could see through the dark. Mm-hmm. It's like night vision poetry. Got night vision. All right. I'm trying to get back to the spot that I jumped off of. Okay. So they separated at the first um, Vatican Council. What? In 1869 and 1870. Mm hmm. Yeah. Don't forget the military's all up in here. Okay. Jensen Church. Switzerland. Okay. Uh, as no bishop had joined any of these groups, recourse was had to the Genesis Church in Holland, which had maintained a somewhat precarious existence in separation from Rome since the 18th century, but had preserved an Episcopal succession recognized by Rome as valid, though irregular. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. They can get their regular, but other people can't. They just become, what, inclandestine or clandestine or whatever word that is. They, same shit all around the world, same song. 
but y'all still outside. Uh, the first consecration of the new order was that of Joseph H. Rinkins, who was made bishop in Germany by a sympathetic bishop of the Janus Church of Holland, Bishop Haycamp of Deventer, on August 11, 1873. Rather um, later, or for similar reasons, though with a certain national emphasis, the Polish National Catholic Church came into being in the United States and Canada. The Episcopal succession was transmitted to this church in 1897 by Bishop E. Herzog of Switzerland. In 1889, the Union of Utrecht was formed and the Declaration of Utrecht, okay, issued in that year by the old Catholic bishops, is the charter of old Catholic doctrine and polity. Adherence to this union are the Old Catholic Church of the Netherlands, the Old Catholic Church of Germany, the Christian Catholic Church of Switzerland, the Old Catholic Church of Austria, and the Polish National Catholic Church, largely Polish-American in membership. The Old Catholic Churches in Pol um, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia suffered severely during and after World War II. The name Old Catholic is sometimes used of other small sects directed by Episcopi uh, Vagantes or Episcopus Vagans or unrecognized bishops, but this is an er um, inaccuracy. Okay, okay. The chief authority of the old Catholic churches is the Conference of Bishops. The Archbishop of Utrecht exercises a kind of honorary primacy. See, primacy, 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 primate, uh, primus mm -hmm, and primal, 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 or something like that. Each diocese has a synagogue with full participation of both clergy and laity in every aspect of the life of the church, including the election of bishops. Okay. Now, the only thing I'm going to add here, I'm not going to. Am I going to go into this? 70 medical councils, public worship, vernacular and public worship, whatever, whatever. Um, the only thing that I'm going to add to this is this, this right here for your consideration. If your government is a religious order, how are you voting for it if you're not a part of it? They're talking about the election of bishops. We can see that it has political, um, military, and religious connotations from as far back as whatever years those were dealing with the word primate as we went through with propaganda and all the rest of that stuff. And at the same time, is not the so-called United States government a religious organization, a military organization, and um, a political one as well? And why would you be able to vote in that order unless you are a part of that order, meaning you yourself are a primate? I don't know how to use it, but I'm just saying we didn't get the right understanding for this stuff. Of course, I wasn't raised in the Catholic Church. I was raised in a Christian one, uh, apostolic one, uh, Church of God and Christ and all of that. And when was the last time we voted on God in a church? But we're voting on a president, not understanding that it's possible that a president is in nothing but another type of bishop, another patriarch, another exarch another metropolitan and all that other stuff. Okay. So this is the year of voting. I mean, even with all the stuff that we know, let me, let me just put this in here with all the stuff that we know and we come across, um, fake holidays and, uh, or holidays that mean certain things. Like one person said that um, one of these shorts up here, they showed that many of these holidays that we celebrate are actually commemorating the 
seven deadly sins, greed and lust and this and that and that, 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 that all this different stuff. And even though we say we don't celebrate these things, we still do. We don't want to offend anyone, so on January 1st, we'll say Happy New Year. We don't want to be loveless, so February, uh, Black History Month, yeah, yeah, flowers and candy, or, or uh, <laughs> should I say um, Netflix and a movie? I'm, I'm sorry, sex and Netflix or whatever, however you want to say that, okay? Um, you know, on down the line, we still celebrate these things, but at the same time, try to say to the masses and maybe try to clear out our understanding, uh, walking contradictions, if you would. Um, we still celebrate these things. We still commemorate these certain cer these things to a certain extent for the masses, for the show, for the stage. Um, but it doesn't look like we're doing them under our original orders unless the people who have taken over this so-called government, this so-called landmass, unless the people who are on the fence about certain things are actually part of that order and making sure that the masses still stay, say, or still say, stay deaf, dumb, and blind about what's really going on. Just some thoughts that I have. Okay. Yeah. Um, I get you, DJ. You said, for the record, it only takes uh, two generations to become pale. Two generations to become pale. Mm-hmm. Mm uh, yeah, I see that on one level, but I take it, uh, what is the pale? Okay. Because just like primates, sometimes people will think that you're only talking about skin color. Let me see. Let me pull this up. Let me bring y'all in. What exactly do you mean, darling? Let me bring y'all over here. Check this out, DJ. Turn that sideways, and that symbol means your middle finger in Britain. <laughs> Check this out. Check this out. Y'all over here. So searches related to the pale, the map of the pale, the pale Wikipedia, the Pale of Orthodoxy, Pale of Jewish Settlement, Map of Pale Settlement, the Russian Pale, the Jewish Pale of Settlement, okay? Beyond the Pale, meaning Jewish, yada yada, okay? And not talking about fucking skin color. For those who don't know, Bring you over. The pale. This article refers to a pale in Ireland. It is not to be confused with the pale of settlement. For other uses, pale or pale as a noun, see pale. Okay. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. Jack fell down and broke his. Yeah. And Jill did what? <clears throat> Became a gymnast. Anyway, um, the pale, Irish, fail, and fail, or an uh, English pale, mm. and I'm not reading that, was the part of Ireland directly under the control of the English government in the late Middle Ages. It had been reduced by the late 15th century to an area along the eastern or the east coast stretching from Dalkey, south of Dublin, to the garrison town of Dundalk. The inland boundary went to Nyas and Liexlip, 
around the earldom of Kildare towards Trim and north toward Kells. In this district, many townlands have English or French names and later associated with Norman influence in England. Mm -hmm. The word pale, meaning a fence, is derived from the Latin word palus, meaning stake. So it only takes two generations to get a stake in this? Yeah. Told you I heard something else on the other side. Anyway, let me keep going. Um, stake. Signif uh, specifically a stake used to support a fence. Mm -hmm. A post. A post. I'm going to do something in a minute. Y'all remember post. I'm going to do something in a minute. I'm going to try to get my ass off here. Anyway, a post. Um, a paling fence is made of pales ganged side by side, and the word palisade is derived from the same root. From this came the figurative meaning of boundary. The Oxford English Dictionary is dubious about the popular notion that the phrase beyond the pale as sometimes outside the boundary, i.e. uncivilized, derives from this specific Irish meaning. Again, derived from the boundary concept was the idea of a pale as an area within which local laws were valid. Y'all still think people are talking about skin color? Mm -hmm. Um. The term was used not only for the pale in Ireland, but also for various other English overseas settlements, notably English Calas or Calias or Calias. Calias, Calias, Calias. Oops, oops, my bad. Hold on. Notably, this right here. Uh, which was a territory in northern France ruled by the monarchs of England from 1347 to 1558. The area which was taken following the Battle of Crucy in 1346 and subsequent siege of Calias, if I'm saying that right, was confirmed at the Treaty of Brittany, or Brittany in 1360. It became an important economic center for England in uh, Europe's textile trade centered in Flanders or Flanders. The pale, which was historically part of Flanders, also provided England with a permanent strategic defensible outpost for which it could plan and lodge military actions on the continent. Its position on the English Channel meant it could be reinforced, garrisoned, and supplied over a short distance by sea. The territory was bilingual with English and Flemish commonly spoken. It was represented in the Parliament of England by the Callias or Callias constituency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's, let's read a little bit more, you know, it, it helps. It helps, okay? During the reign of Mary I of England, the Pale was unexpectedly retaken by the French following the siege in 1558 during their campaigns against the Spanish, whose king was also married to Queen Mary. Damn, talk about a house divided in the country of Flanders. Subsequently, damn, subsequently, the English textile trade abandoned Callias and moved to the Habsburg Netherlands. Um, Tippenham. The Pale is a jurisdiction area. English C A L E S now supplanted by French, C-A-L-A-I-S, derives from C-A-L-E-T-I, an ancient Celtic people who lived along the coast of the English Channel. It pays to read. It really, really pays, 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 pays to read. Oh, look. Gold coins of Edward III. Mm. Oh, boy, boy, boy. The pale. What you put down here? 
Woo, Lord have mercy, Jesus. Okay, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Uh, so you got down here, pale 13th century uh, Anglo-Latin steak pole, steak for vines from old French P-A-L and directed, directed and directly from Latin pilot steak prop, wooden post, yep, post. Source also Spanish and Italian pilot pelo, um, which is from photo Europe, uh, photo Indo-European root, house glow, suffix form of root pack to fasten. Mm-hmm, that word. A figurative sense of limit boundary restriction is from the 14th century and survives barely in beyond the pale and similar phrases, meaning a part of the Ireland under English rule is by the 1540s. The thing itself dates to the conquest of Henry II via the nations of enclosed space, hence district or region within the determined boundaries, hence territory held by power of a nation or people mid 15th century. Paling, fence formed by connecting pointed vertical stakes by horizontal rails above and below 1550s from the from pale, a noun. Uh, I'm just saying. Because when people start hollering that color shit, they always setting up a boundary, ain't they? Yeah. Boundary so good that uh, I got called a f- uh, tether. <laughs> I'm sorry. Funny ass shit. Okay. Um... I'm pretty sure you guys can read that yourself. It's some information in there, but I can tell y'all I'm getting a little hungry. And I'm going to need to go get me some food. They go to Siege of Boulogne. They go to Burgundian territory in the Low Countries between France and Spain. And, uh huh. Strait of Dover. I heard that before. Hey. What what state is that? They got a place called Dover over here. Oh, my bad. By 1453, at the end of the Hundred Years' War, the Pale was the last part of mainland France in English hands. It served successfully as a base for, of English expeditions. For example, in 1492. From it, Henry the Seventh launched, launched the siege of Boulogne. Yeah, that part. That part. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna say this. This may be tedious for some. This may be dumb because they already know it. For some, it just may be you know, a bunch of useless facts. But you know that. I'm just trying to figure it out from where I sit, right? But also providing an example for others, whether it's because I sit up here and read, because I'm showing an example of studying in real time, thinking about certain things in real time, or whatever, just giving that example. But at the same time, it's also an example of what we need to make sure that our children, our young folks who are still in school, still studying as five days a week, nine months out of the year in school, studying in school, okay, um, that we should start them off early enough so that they will study that they will understand world history and not the indoctrinated bias monkey trick of American history. That way, when they start to wake up to whatever it is that you're trying to show them, that they were the original peoples here in America, um, that our lands were taken, whatever the story is in this consciousness movement that we have, whatever you want to call it, okay, whatever movement you want to call it, that way they'll already have the historical facts of world history to put in there, and it'll make it less able for these people when they're in their 20s and 30s and 40s to be duped in the same way that we were duped because we were getting new information about our identity. I think that it would help for them not to have an identity crisis 
and be pigeonholed into such m small minded thinking as black and white and dark skin and curly hair and nappy hair and the pan African story or the pan Arab story or the pan Oriental story or, or pan American. You, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so, you know, while they're young enough, and I don't know what all they're doing in school anymore. I only have glimpses of what I used to do when I was in elementary, because that's where my mind is set at, um, of, you know, maps and geography and putting names on maps and this, that, and the other. And it never really fit to me. It was just, we're studying this this week and that, that week, and the shit wasn't retainable, okay? Um, so I don't know if they're still learning geography like that. I, I really don't think so because all they need nowadays are workers until they find that elite child that they can move on out the way and take into their whatever, their orders or whatever, and take them away from the family and the community. But at the same time, let, let's put it like this. You guys should remember the movie 300. And, you know, the thing about the thing that I recognize when that small group of men were fighting these Persians coming in, they talked about the Persians and I'm, I'm assuming it's the Persian. I may not be saying that correctly, but I'm re thinking it was the Persians. They were talking about the Persians that their uh, strategy of attack was that when someone fell in the front, the one in the back just moved in and it was so many of them that they always feel that gap. So this small group of people were getting an onslaught of people that just kept filling the holes and filling the gaps. All right. Um, that's the same way that we should be. That even though we may be a small minority, and I don't think we're that small in, in, in terms of this, but though we're a small minority in whatever areas we're looking at, because we got a lot of shit against us, but as a small minority, um, how can I say it? It's not what the, the cliche is um, quality over quantity, or as one sister would say, a well informed minority can control an uninformed majority. And if we were to make sure our children had those libraries, that they spent more time studying than playing video games and doing more time doing book reports and reading, we won't have grown, as many grown adults who, one, are childish in the mind, and two, who do not understand what a logical fallacy is, that they can make the distinctions that they need. Um, by having world information, okay? You know, I mean, you can make it a game for your children. Nobody would give a shit about Flanders, but what if this week they had to tell you about Flanders to get a, good, a gift, remember? Or to get a prize or a reward or something. You know, remember when I said that in child psychology, they said that if children cannot accept, um, if they don't get um, attention for good behavior, they'll accept attention for bad behavior. And that can be easily flipped if you're creative about what you're doing and you have vision and focus for where you want your future to be. You know, as one sister was telling me, she was, we were talking about Moses and them. And I had to laugh because she's like, you know, we all know Moses, they, they supposedly went around the mountain for 40 years for a trip that was only two days long. And for those of us who were under religious indoctrination, we thought that that was the way it was because that was what was written in the biblical text. We can't go back and change it. Yeah, it is. And a social construct as well, DJ. OK, we can't go back and change it. So we got to accept it as what it is, like the, the trial by ordeal or uh, numbers 524. 
you know, just because he was jealous, she ain't done nothing wrong, but give her this bitter root that may or may not kill her, may or may not make her sick because he was jealous. Not even analyzing your own common sense, analyzing it and using your own common sense, think it might be real. There's something that's supposed to be killing our own self softly, you know, <laughs> with his song, if you would. Um, but they were going around the mountains for 40 years, supposedly, or in the wilderness for 40 years and for a two-day journey. And what the sister was saying was, and we, we kind of both agreed, I can't remember exactly how it was said, but it was like, Moses didn't want to take the motherfuckers, excuse my language, because it wasn't said like this, but I'm just going to say it how it is. Moses didn't want to take all them old motherfuckers. <laughs> I'm trying to say it the other way, it just won't come out right. <laughs> Moses had no intention of taking that generation into the promised land. Okay. He was waiting for the Joshua generation. And the same is true here. Um, that if us old folks with indoctrination don't change our ways for the sake of the young ones, our lineage, our heritage, our legacy coming behind us. Um, then we can't complain in the future when those children have no attachments to their family or their community because we start, we left them in indoctrination knowing that there was a great army, if you would, set against them. And excuse me for being poetic here, but an, an army set against them to continue to indoctrinate them and lead them Every, lead them astray and turn them every which way but loose. So, um, you know, I know some of you guys came through and y'all been sitting in here and I'm pretty sure that by tonight or tomorrow, I'll see how many people, you know, really came by and listened to this ooh, three hour stream. Okay. Um, and I know it may look like, you know, I know y'all was like, wait a minute, what not be talking about? I made the monkey trick. What's she talking about? That caught your attention. But coming in here to actually look at what it is, like, man, eh, don't nobody want to hear that shit. But what if you did? Because it's one thing to have the information and say, hey, this and this and this and be able to put your finger on it. It's another thing just to say it's mythology and screw all mythology and and, you know, just blanket it and ignore it for something else. Because in my opinion, when you look at this, you know, when you just brush it aside and go for what's popular, what ends up happening is um, it, it's like what the biblical text talks about. They, you know, uh, well, I don't know if it's all the way in all the way in the biblical text, but they talk about they sat down to eat and drink and got up to play. OK, no, we sit down and eat. And drink so that we can get up and work like we're supposed to, if you have to look at it that way. OK, um, post. Let me go to this word post. Cause, uh, and then I'm going to get off of here. Really? Let me see if I can find it. Uh, the word post. Nope, let's go to the Bible dictionary. Or Bible Gateway. One of my favorite ones. Or I said Bible Gateway. No, I didn't. <laughs> passage look up. Let's see if we can get it to come up. I don't want a passage. I want a keyword. And the word I want is post. Okay, give me a, oh shit, it's a lot of them. I got to find that one that it is. Move. Let me see. Okay, I don't want Exodus, I know. Because that's where Post shows up a lot when they're building the temple. go further and it's not that many of them 30 frames post 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 because of pale pale because of boundary 
But there's a scripture here. Okay, lay minutes. I got him to go to the door. Okay, judges. That's Samson. They mentioned post there, but hold on. Okay, he broke down the post. Okay. Matan. Okay, Matan, the priest of Baal. Oh, okay, we already ran into that. Okay, I got that. Hold on a second. Uh, oh, come on. Damn, I thought it said inquire. Oh, okay. Shoot, that's why we can't find it. Let me try it again. Uh... Nope, we don't want it in that version. We want it in the other version. And what I'm looking for is a scripture in the King James Version about inquiring at the post. Uh, let me see. I'm sorry, if I can't find it this this uh, while I'm looking for it here. Okay, if I can't find it, then I'm just going to let it go. No, no, no. Go on the side post. Uh, shoot. Is this it? Okay, I think this might be the one that I'm looking for. So I think this might be it. Um, it would be Second Chronicles 30, 26. I mean, 30 and 6. Mm, somebody's tires are just bumping around. All right, I hope y'all understand this, and I know that some people will have problems because I'm not reading this in context, something that I learned to do a while, a while back, um, many years ago, and y'all may not agree with it, but I'm going to read this right here. Um, understand some of this is like code, coded. Just, just keep in mind that it's coded, okay? Don't anthropomorphize this shit, and then I'm going to try to do what, the, the, what comes to mind with me. So Second Chronicles 30 and 6 says, so the post, P-O-S-T-S, -S, went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and, Jude and Judah. And according to the commandment of the king, saying, ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. Now, I'm not real good on history. I'm still trying to figure it out. But there's something that we have to return to. Like I said, reestablish your orders. Build up that which was torn down, knowing that it was torn down to scatter you amongst the other religious nations, other armies, other political factions, returning to your first love, your family, because I, I don't believe that we came on the bottom of a, a slave ship because of the religious narrative 
and the religious propaganda being where it came from and what it reduced itself down to, okay? So in here, I take certain things out of here, the king and his princes, the post, meaning we're all on guard for something. We're all standing on post for something. All around the world, the same song. Even if you don't know you in a war, you in a war, okay? Um, and it says, turn again to what? It says one thing here, AAI, <laughs> I don't know. Um, it says one thing here, but turn again to what was destroyed in times past. Not with that of an evil heart, but with that of um, to escape what's been brought to you through conquest. But also, watch this. I got one more for you. And I know y'all don't like when I do this, so I ain't got to worry about the people that don't like it. Um how about this one? First Kings twenty one twenty one. Check this out. Check this out. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee and will take away thy posterity and will cut off from Ahab him that pisses against a wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I'm pretty sure it's some more shit to go with that. Um, but the reason why I read that one is because the politics and the religion, uh, in the church, war, uh, war, conquest, all this stuff, our prosperity has been taken away from us because we allowed them to be miseducate, miseducated by, I have to say it, religious propaganda religious dogma false history because they don't really know the truth they know the religion only to make them worship and be workers but not to have their own mind to understand what a great legacy we have by being here okay um i i can't make you believe that you got to know that okay Oh, it's got another name, Shishnag. It's got another name? Because I thought that was the, oh, what is it? Ophorus or something like that? I thought that was the other name for it. Or oh, a five-headed serpent. Okay. Anyway, I'm sorry. Let me get my butt off of here. I'm getting cold. I got to walk this dog. I got to give you something to eat. I got to get ready for work tonight or in the morning, in the middle of the night. Anyway. I appreciate you guys coming through. I hope you found something that you could use, um, something that maybe would help you to understand some things that you, like myself, didn't understand or didn't know. Um, just putting it out there. A primate is not a monkey. Why are we having these conversations about creationism and evolution? Okay. Somebody created it and it evolved. Okay. It's both of those things, but in two different dimensions, primate. It's them bishops. It's that religious, that military, and that ecclesiastical order that was a long time ago established but has been fighting for centuries upon centuries, millennia, okay? And then it's the students who got it, had a new thing to do. They named a monkey, a primate, told you you descended from them when you did not. You descended from the highest orders that they were, civilized orders. And that's what they took from us and broke, broke us down, brought us down, not just to mere men because, you know, men as in mankind, to mere men, but brought us beneath that to act like animals and to act like savages and to act like we have no decorum in social settings, if you would nor the capacity to lift ourselves back up out of the muck and mire that we find ourselves in today. So that's where I sit. And if y'all can tell, um, I got rid of some of that anger that was on me from what happened. And I'm going to get back to my studies. And I just wanted to share this study with you guys um, so that we understand that whole primate thing is a monkey trick. Okay. And if you've fallen for it, do they have monkeys in the circus? Because monkey hear, see, and speak. 
no evil. All right? Because they ain't really saying shit. Anyway, peace, family. I'm going to go on and get out of here. I'm going to uh, bring this thing back around. You guys can listen to it. And if y'all want to, go back and listen to it again. Check out DJ in the chat. He's always dropping knowledge in this chat. I appreciate him for what he does because it helps out. It helps to elevate our thinking, expand our minds, if you would. Um, have us looking at things that maybe we weren't looking at before, at least for me. Okay. And and as you can see, language is a part of that. But um, the culture is in the language. And the changing of languages is one of the reasons why we've been acculturated. <laughs> I guess I just play with that word for a minute, you know. Um, but anyway, let me get on off of here. I uh, appreciate you guys for coming through. Um, for your time and attention. And again, I hope y'all found something that y'all could use. So um, we're going to go on out uh, as soon as I find out what I'm going out with. And again, I thank you guys for coming. Appreciate you. And y'all be careful out there. Pay attention. Understand that what you're voting for is a religious order. Okay why you think you're not religious. Peace, family.